everybody, welcome to the YouTube podcast. Hello, hello everybody, this is Carlos Arcelor and welcome to the YouTube podcast. Today we have an iconic legend that anybody who's been in esports for longer than a day should know. His name is Joe Miller and we have him with us. How's it going, bro? Hey, buddy. Super <laughs> happy to be today uh, with you today. You've caught me on a bad one, though. I've been looking and I've got really bad bags under my eyes. Oh, come because on. I had, to, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. to get a train this morning. So uh, if I fall asleep randomly, then you know why. <laughs> <laughs> Since when have you been so focused on that? You were just hand That's your handsomeness. Your handsomeness is that you don't care, but you look glorious anyway. And there's another reason. Uh, also, because it's great to talk to you, but also because I'm in the office, right? And oh. I've, we're doing a bit of a social experiment with this as well, because I've put a sign on the door that says, do not enter recording <laughs> podcast. So we'll see how many people actually come through the door without reading a sign. Honestly, I'm so glad that nobody from G2 actually works there because I'm pretty sure some of us, myself included, could, I mean, that's the kind of people we are. It says, do not disturb. We will just maybe think two more seconds before opening, but we'll open anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've got big glass. The, the front wall is literally glass. Like, I think in this picture behind me, you can see people walking by. So, okay, it's okay. not like they can't see that I'm talking to someone. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure in, in the course of this hour and a half, two hours or whatever, that at least one person will walk in. And then I'll name them and shame them. <laughs> please, please do that. Yeah. Everybody needs to know who the fuck destroyed our our take, okay? Our, yeah. our recording. So anyway, man, we've been together for a long time. And actually, for everybody that's, that's not watching, we actually recorded for like two minutes. But then I literally just kicked the camera. <laughs> <laughs> I literally just kicked the camera with my foot. And, and we had to remake the whole thing. So I'm trying not to kick the camera again. And if I do a production, please just turn up and, re uh, you know, reallocate it, okay? Reposition it. It's totally fine. We're doing this thing real, you know? We take it real. Joe, I know how you started in gaming, and you've, for me, you've been, in my eyes, like, I have to say top three of all time, as in esports casters. And maybe I would even say higher than that. Like, the, I think, uh, you know, your, your accent, how smooth you talk, when you kind of use the emphasis, you know, whenever there's something great happening, you know when to, uh, uh, what what pitch even to yell. Like, it's actually crazy. Like, people don't understand how hard that is. Um, but before you got into any of this, you, of course, were a gamer. So why don't you walk yeah. me a little bit through, you know, what were your first games that you played and so on and so forth? Uh, I think, like, before PC, I have, like, a really standard, boring kind of, this is how you got into gaming in childhood, right? Like, you got a NES and then Super Nintendo and then a PlayStation and all that kind of stuff that, like, I feel like everyone who's older than 25 had that start into, into eSports somehow. Um, but it really changed for me when I my dad bought a decent PC. Like, my dad was always... A closet nerd or not really so cl not really that closet i mean he was always buying like the first pcs he had the internet before anyone i ever knew had the internet um and then he bought a decent pc and we bought battlefield 1942 together and um i was playing that for a little while and on one of the servers that i was on randomly played two or three games with some guys and they invited me to join Teamspeak. right so Ended up jumping straight into a team. Then basically after about two months buying my own PC because my dad was really pissed off that I was just using his PC to practice like <laughs> five nights a week. Um, and they never, he never got to play himself. So I ended up, or he, I think, paid, paid for most of that. Um, and then, you know, started playing in this, this little team, mostly English players, actually. In fact, I think maybe even all English players. And then after a while, I went to, um, funnily enough, when I was 16, I know exactly because the story, uh, story I'll tell you in a second, I was 16, I went to uh, my first LAN event where I played on a mixed team with Odie from Team Dignitas. Shit! And Odie thought I was older than 16. <laughs> 
Odie bought me a beer in the bar on the first night, and I downed it. And then he asked me, how old are you? I said, yeah, I'm 16. Which, of course, in, in England is uh, not legal. You have to be 18. That's, a, that's England, the wrong so. course of action, Odie. So, uh, exactly. Odie actually uh, <laughs> basically ruined me uh, from a very young age when it comes to that kind of thing. No, but that's that. And then, you know, I, I played in this team with Odie, and he was pretty impressed with how I was playing. And I ended up through some contacts, then joining one of the top battlefield teams in Europe, mostly a, a Swedish team, but with some other Europeans in there as well. Um, and then played back in the day, like uh, in clan base Euro Cup and, and stuff like that. And that's how I then went on and met Demon. So, clan base. You, you just mentioned clan base. I think it's the first time somebody mentions clan base. I remember that, <laughs> I mean, like if it was yesterday, but anybody. I mean, like most of the people that follow esports today have no idea what you're talking about. And, nope. and that's like the beginnings. Like, yeah. explain what clan base is. So clan base was, I mean, everyone knows ESL right now. Obviously, if you don't know ESL more than the pro product stuff. So, you know, an IEM or ESL one or pro league. ESL also also has this huge community behind it right where we have admins working their asses off to run leagues in thousands i'm sure by now different games um and clan base was exactly that but well i was 16 so uh i don't know 20 years ago maybe close enough um and they they had like this tier system so you had like an open ladder then if you were good enough, then you played in an open cup, which was actually was an open signing. And then the top, I think, 20 or 30 teams then played in the in the Euro Cup, which was like it had prize money, which was pretty actually it may have just had mouse mats, but close enough to prize <laughs> money. Um, you know, back then we didn't play for lots of money. We didn't play because we were being paid to. There was no Ocelot paying us a monthly salary <laughs> to win big. You know, we had to, we just played for fun. We played because we loved it. We played because we really wanted to. I'm pretty sure we also, back then, even though if you won this tournament, you literally each player won a mouse pad, I think we still put in more hours than some pro teams might even put in today. Like, that's how serious it was, but on a on a non-sickle level, right? It didn't make any sense that we'd practice five hours every night to win a mouse pad. That literally doesn't make <laughs> any sense to any person that has a brain. But we did because we loved it. And I think that's a big difference uh, because yeah. whoever is starting, whoever is 16 today and is like looking at Ninja with 120,000 viewers on Fortnite, which, I mean, I'm not going to get whether Fortnite is, is an eSport or not, but, uh, you know, that kid watching Ninja... He already has that context in mind when installing the game. Yeah. Like he has a different motivation by default. Or maybe not different, but is uh, he? It's it's not as pure. That's the truth. He's not as pure as the, the the kid that before he knows he can get rich playing football, takes the ball and goes out and plays. Or yeah. in that case, like you and I, and in this case, in this case yourself with Odi, for example, the founder of Dignitas uh, with Battlefield. You just played because you loved it, right? Yeah. And there's something pure about that that I think is going to be almost, almost impossible to get back, I think. I mean, it's a difficult one, right? Because if you look at football, the same system's there in theory, right? The, the progression is there in terms of if you're the best, you can earn so much money that you literally can't spend it anymore. Um, but you still have kids playing because they love it. People still play football well into their late 30s, 40s, maybe some people even 50s in these like men's teams, right? Because they just love playing football. They just absolutely love the thrill of meeting up with their friends, getting better, playing against their local village team and beating them and then going for a beer afterwards. That's right. like the, this this the thrill is still there. So while I, I think you're you're right on a level, this is a little bit different because you do these days have people I mean, people will install games because they see 
a prize pool of 100 million has been announced for Fortnite. Or, you know, FIFA tournaments are now earning players a quarter of a million if you win the world championship. So there's that, that motivation, I think, is definitely these days sparked by money more than it was, more than it is in a, in a sport like football, definitely. And definitely even more than it was for us back then because it just didn't exist. The thing is that proportionally, I agree with you, by the way, proportionally, um, you know, when you go out and play with your friends, a, a football match, a soccer match, you just go out and play, right? But the the this uh, the proportional example or the equal example for esports or what you guys were doing with Battlefield is that not only would they play together uh, soccer, but also after the game, maybe the guy goes and trains legs for two hours in the gym and then also looks for his perfect diet so that he doesn't get a glimpse of you know fat and then he yeah. wakes up in, in the morning and you know for a run for a 45 minute run is that level of try harding you know that you guys and, and and myself at the very beginning as well had for literally zero money like you literally yeah. spent money yourself on the internet connection and all those things uh, sometimes traveling you literally spent money yourself for the possibility of of competing and that has a, is the pure love for competition that i think will always differentiate the very old school or some of the very old school esports people from those that come on you uh, we yeah. we've, we've been in that moment right we've been in that moment when <clears throat> you were playing that those battlefield games and you were just enjoying it so much that level of competition that you just couldn't put it down i don't wanna, i don't want to say it's sad but it kind of <laughs> it just is, is yeah a little bit right like i think that lots of people undoubtedly only play and i especially think younger people like i'm talking in like eight years to 14 years old right rather than uh 18 to 20 or, or something like that in terms of young like really young players i think right now a game like fortnite actually is kind of doing that from like i know a lot of people like my little cousin who plays fortnite and you know he's aware of people like ninja and he's aware that tournaments are there and stuff like that but actually he loves the game because he gets to play with his friends after school and you know his mom has to kick him off every night so that he can do some homework or uh you know go out with his friends into the real world that everyone's talking about these days. Um, but I also think that those kids have kind of got it a little bit easier because their parents nowadays also see that there's something True. there. They see Far that actually understanding. There, is, there is something there. If, is, is my son really good? If my son is really good, then he could do this for a job. He could actually make a career out of this, which... Now, I'm sure we could literally talk for like hours on just this topic. It's it's really kind of deep and actually super interesting as well that, you know, the parallels to all are just different, I think. Like they've kind of just shifted up a level. So talking about not getting compensated for being good at whatever it is, you started <clears throat> um, as a shoutcaster or commentating in Battlefield, actually. And yeah, how did that all happen, and how did you get into this? Um, so after do, playing in Clambase, um, I met Demon, who was a uh, an admin for the Euro Cup. I was an admin for the Open Cup. So being an admin back then was kind of strange because you know there was no real great graphical interface to restart servers and stuff. You were literally doing everything by uh, text command and all that kind of stuff. Um, Battlefield was also a nightmare because it was literally 10 versus 10 that we played. So there were 20 people to get out there on time, make sure they were all ready, make sure nobody crashed, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then after each game, each admin wrote a report about the game that was like, we used to put a huge report in text of what happened in the game, who was doing well early, who then changed it around and who won. And I think that's where I kind of got the that idea of commentating from because I was writing these reports and I thought, well, it'd be cool to do that live. Demon was already doing it. And bear in mind, this is way before any Twitch or own TV, even before that, or anything else video-wise was even 
possible from home. We literally were streaming on a on a Winamp plugin called Shoutcast, which is where that word obviously comes from. Um, and Demon just asked me one day, hey, I don't have anyone to cast with. Do you want to cast with me for this game? And I said, yeah, sure. Okay. I remember listening back to it and thinking, oh, my God, that was so embarrassing. <laughs> Luckily for us, there were only like 100 people listening probably back in the day, which actually were pretty big numbers. But um, if I listen back now, there is the, the, the difference is incredible. Like my accent is totally different. Obviously, pacing and everything, you can't even really compare because doing radio commentary compared to a, a video commentary is totally different as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it just went from there. We did hundreds and hundreds of online casts. And then we went and did our first event, which was uh, in Denmark at the end of 2004, I think. And we this is what you were talking about, right? We did everything off the back of our own money. So this trip was all kinds of crazy because Lee said, okay, let's go to this Denmark in, uh, what was the place called? Skorgen or some weird... I'm sure Danish people are going to hate me, but that's about as close as I can get. It's like literally Sk the Skorgen most... Skorgen sounds like a Danish place in which some kind of god beast would murder you. I'm pretty sure that is the place, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the most northern tip of Denmark, right? And you literally drive across like sand dunes to, to get into the... Uh, you can't even call it a city. It's like this small town. So we drove there. Um, my dad drove me down the motorway to meet Lee who we then drove to a, a, a port in England. Lee forgot his passport, so his dad drove his passport uh, back from his house to, the, to where we were going. And then we took a ferry overnight to somewhere else in Denmark and then drove for like three or four hours to this, to this hall. I mean, it was like a, a school gymnasium or something. And then there were like, I don't know, 20 teams from all over Europe who'd all driven themselves really? with big CRT monitors. Uh, Mouse Sports were there. Dignitas were there. Like These big names were already there in that time in Battlefield. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, we took all our microphones, both took our PC, both took our monitors, everything packed into Lee's car and went there and commentated this event and all on our own money. Like We literally spent maybe five six hundred pounds each just get in there and back that's crazy so, so you... yeah we i mean we did it because we were part of this community and you know everyone loved us for doing it yeah that obviously plays a part but we did it because we just loved the game because it like and this was kind of the end so it was kind of like this big final chance to get all the big european teams together it was clan base again euro cup finals on lan like land finals for Battlefield back then were just like never uh, heard of. So amazing experience. Yeah, that was the first like big land tournament. And and now you come you like people right now are, and um, I mean, and it's, it's, I don't think it's wrong to state this, but how hard it is to put a battle royale tournament together with all those people, you know, that offline event with so many people in there. Well, you know, Battlefield. Battlefield tournament offline must have been fucking ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, because it was BYOC as well, right? Bring your own Oh computer. my god, yeah, everybody with so their own. There's, my there's, god. There's, there's, there's no tournament <laughs> set up, so the organizers laid power network and desks made out of uh, pallets. Everyone brought their own their own shit with them, right? And this is literally, I don't know, 20 teams, each with 10 players in him. So at least <laughs> at least 200 players in this hall, plus what we set up. Like, if you if you think of a production now, um, running the, the cost of running a 100 man battle royale, plus having a broadcast around it is just insanely high, right? And back then, we just all did it ourselves. Okay. It was no fancy TV production, it was just a radio stream, but still, uh, for the day, it was pretty impressive. Absolutely. So <clears throat> you guys casted in uh, Battlefield for about how, how many years or how, how long? Um, 
I'd say until early 2005. Okay. Maybe. Okay. So um, long time. At, at, yeah, at that point. So at that point, I joined TSN, which is a company that, again, doesn't exist, but had some back in the day really, really big names uh, doing broadcasts. Um, and that's about the time when I figured, okay, this is something that I could maybe think about doing, you know, longer term, maybe even earn some money from it. Because right now I was probably all in all, I don't know, over those last five years, realistically, thousands of pounds in the minus from doing it, right? Um, and then there was the Painkiller World Tour for CPL. It was 2000... Uh, that game was nice to watch, I remember. Yeah. It was super fast. It was deathmatch. I mean, it looked like ass, right? Because that's what that's what games were in back in the day. And to get an edge over your opponent, you turned everything down as far as you can. So it's literally just textures and the enemy model somewhere. Um, but yeah, then 2005 came around, CPL World Tour. It was a million-dollar tour. And everyone was like, holy crap, this is like esports is getting big. So I decided, okay, that's it. I'm going to commentate on Painkiller, and I'm going to go on this tour. I'm going to definitely get on this tour. I'm going to work my ass off to get on this tour, whatever it takes. And I did a talk show. Um, I mean, I, did, I, I commentated all European stuff anyway, but I did a talk show with the American guys from TSN, which started at like 3 a.m. UK time. And obviously, at this time, I was still at school. Um, so my parents said, look, you can do it but obviously not in your bedroom because your sister has to sleep to get up for school and we have to go to work. So if you really want to do this, then you have to take your PC every single time you do this at once a week into the garden, into the shed at the bottom of the garden, set it up again and test if the Wi-Fi works. If the Wi-Fi doesn't work, then you need to run a cable all the way down the garden and do it from there. And that's what I did for an entire year. Like every three week. A- 3 a.m. till 5 a.m. and then at 7 a.m. I got up for school, most times. Oh <laughs> my God, you did that? Yeah. Jesus, talk about commitment. And you did that for so did, did you did you so it was a whole year you said? So, the the tour was I think like January until um, November. So January was Turkey, but I remember Turkey was the first stop that they were gonna do. And there was a huge snowstorm. Um, so the guys that were supposed to do it just couldn't get there. They, in fact, I think they even canceled it and did it like a week or two later. The problem was this tournament back then was basically being funded, or at least the, the commentary team, I mean, were being funded by NVIDIA, who was sponsoring the event. And uh, I was still 17. And they said, no, sorry, we can't pay for you to fly because you're, you're underage. So I was like, fuck, what am I going to do now? So I just waited it out until I was 18. And funnily enough, the first, the first stop, and I, I missed all these cool stops, right? Like the first one was Turkey. The second one was um, Barcelona, I think. And then it went to Brazil. And then the next one, where I finally turned 18, was in Sheffield, which is literally where I'm born. <laughs> I was like, I got absolutely fucked with this. <laughs> I was like, God damn it. Finally get a chance, and it's in my hometown. Great. Um, <laughs> but obviously, uh, I went there and, and, and did the job, blah, blah, blah. And I think a week later, maybe, I got my A-level results, uh, which is like the, the last... Uh, what they call last exams you do in England before you go to university, Mm -hmm. which were okay. I got offers to go to university um, to do sports uh, journalism, um, marine biology. Somehow, I don't know how to do that one. Yeah, that was some... Like, if you tell me, guess guess what I studied. That's probably the the last thing I I would ever say. No, but... I mean, first of all, I, I suppose I should tell you how I even survived during those, that period where I wasn't making any money. So when I was 14, I started working in a shop that sold uh, aquariums and oh. fish for aquariums. And I, I worked when I was 14 years old. 
I did 10 and a half hours on a Saturday and 10 and a half hours on a Sunday. And I did that literally until I went full time in esports. That's insane. Um, yeah. Obviously, when I was 16 during school holidays, I worked like full time there and then just cast it in the evenings and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that's why marine biology came around because I was a big fan of fish. <laughs> <laughs> you learn the yeah. you learn this I mean, podcast is hilarious <laughs> why, i mean why not many people know that about me right so, yeah. uh, <laughs> That's so hilarious. yeah so i had these off uh, these offers to go and go to go to university right all my other friends were going to university to study teaching or whatever else they they all did some doing apprenticeships to become plumbers or builders or whatever um and then after i did this event in sheffield um the company I was working for, TSN, came to me and said, Joe, in September, we're doing the next three stops, which is one weekend in Singapore, like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then on Monday, we fly to Milan, to uh, Milan Games Week, and do Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then after that, we fly to Santiago in Chile, 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 whatever, um, and then do it there. So like three weekends in a row. And... The first weekend was when I was supposed to start university. Um, so I had this decision, right? Either <laughs> I'm a normal person who goes to university, <laughs> studies, and then does everything later, or I take a risk. Um, and I went to my dad and said, look, I have no idea what to do. What, what should I do? Like, I feel this is a big chance for me. I was getting paid. I can't remember how much, but it wasn't a lot. It was maybe $1,000 for all three events or something. I'm getting paid for it. What, what, what should I do? And he said, well, you know, I'm your dad, and the sensible thing would be to do is to, do is to go to university, to get your studies, and then see how this all folds out, and you can always follow it later. Or... You can follow your dream, and if it doesn't work, you say, fuck it, and then you go study in the year after. And that's what I did. I said, I'm going to take a risk. And then I did the finals live on MTV, which back then MTV was like actual cool shit yeah. and not like, I don't know what shit they have on there these days, but it's not cool They anymore. still have some music, and they still do some stuff, but it's mostly reality TV shit. Exactly. So, yeah scripted reality yeah. not not great uh, but back then like we worked with the producer of the who uh, did the mtv music awards yeah so it kind of worked out and at that, that point amazing. i went full time so yeah are, are you uh, by the way we, we can later speak did you actually know that i uh, we we did a, a reality tv show on uh, one of our spanish teams two years and a half ago that was aired on mtv spain and it was exactly what you uh, hope it's not. <laughs> it was amazing, by the so way. So <laughs> I imagine this is how this went, right? So you went into a meeting <laughs> thinking, fuck yeah, big sponsor, MTV. <laughs> I, I, I get to decide what I do with all this money, make a cool, cool documentary around my brand and my team. And they came in and said, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. That's what happened. I, you're, you're overly paraphrasing, but let's just say that <laughs> yeah, let's just say that um, that um, we had to feed the um, we had to feed the, the the program, right? And that requires you to be sensible with what the pro program looks like. Simple, you have to angle it accordingly. It's it's tough, but that's how things work. Uh, but yeah. I mean, I had a blast. I thought it was amazing. I, it's like, <laughs> it's the kind of stuff that uh, many people will give you shit you will give shit you for, but uh, will give you shit for. But um, at the same time, it's just so different than f from anything we've ever done before. It was just amazing. It was just a blast. I, I think those kind of things are going to continue to come. Right? I mean. Um... Lots of people want to cash in on on what we're doing and what we have been doing, what we've been building, and what it can become. So those kind of those kind of production companies or those kind of TV networks are always going to come by with some crazy idea that's yeah. worked in landscape A, Bro, and, and, and it succeeded. Like it, here as well. it was the most watched show in MTV Spain in a whole year round, actually. So it, it I mean, they they just 
know what works for them and you know, their, yeah. their target audience likes that shit. So uh, with that said, I mean, I, I actually didn't know that you hustled that much. Uh, how hard was it with those? I mean, how did you wrap your head around, you know, a lot of your friends playing games all day, which I'm sure you had. A lot of your friends being outside all day, which I'm sure you had. Some of them just living a fulfilling life uh, and all of a sudden, or what, the, what they would consider a fulfilling fun life. And, and then all of a sudden you see yourself working and doing a lot of hours just for the sake of, you know, um, generating money uh, for yourself and be a little um, bit self-sufficient. So it, it wasn't too bad. Like, you know, when I started working in the aquarium shop when I was 14, I think I earned 30 pounds for 22 hours work on a weekend, oh which is, my by the God. way, definitely that's, slave that's labor. Border, yeah, that's borderline. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, that's borderline <laughs> legal. Definitely <laughs> not le yeah, that's definitely not legal. Um, but I did it, and I was the richest 14-year-old who wasn't getting money from his parents, right? So it kind of was cool. I could buy games whenever I wanted to, and I enjoyed that. I, I really enjoyed working there. Um, I think for me, the toughest bit came when... You know, 2005 happened. That was all cool. Um, then 2006 came along. CPL kind of died, like, completely on its ass. And then a uh, World Series of Video Games came around, which, um, you know, was kind of half revolutionary. It kind of took the, the CPL model and said, okay, we're going we're gonna to try and make this cooler. So they went uh, in 2006 with... Counter Strike in some places, uh, Guitar Hero in some places. That's a nice, you, you started off strong right there. Nice combination. World of Warcraft, I think <laughs> from 2007, though, if I'm not wrong. I don't know if they had World of Warcraft in 2006 as well. I'd have to look that up. I'm, my, I'm, my... I'm, I'm sure it was. Yeah, I'm sure it was either both. Uh, either, either six or seven. Uh, it was when yeah. the when when he took off. Took off. Yeah, exactly. So, and and that kind of, I, I started working with those guys and they gave me a contract for a year. So I did all their events, um, which were not not so many, but enough at the side of working in the aquarium shop to live, right? So I was like, okay, I'm traveling the world, doing esports. Yeah, I have to do some long shifts in, in between at this, at this place that I still enjoyed working at, at the time. So it wasn't too bad, but in 2007... They started the season again, and then I think after two stops, they canceled it, like, full on. We did an event in Toronto. The next event was supposed to happen, like, in LA, I think it was. And then, bam. No, this is not uh, working for us. It doesn't pay the bills. We're basically gone. And so at that point, I was like, shit, what do I do now? Like, really? Because at that point, it was there was not so much going on, right? WSVG was the the next cool thing after CPL, but there was nothing really to take over for it after that. And I think that's where um, ESL really started to to grow because they benefited quite well from this in the fact that um, Intel moved their global stuff. I mean, this, obviously, Intel is a, a, a long, 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 long time support of the ESL way before any of this. But um, that's when ESL events first started coming like to this international stage. That's when Intel Extreme Masters uh, Los Angeles, which is where the World of Warcraft guy, a year after, put his hand through the branding because he was really pissed off. Oh, forgot I his, remember that. Forgot his name. I remember that. Father he was really that. angry. He was really angry and punched like a hole in the in the banner. I <laughs> Everyone was that. like, oh, "You can't do that." Um, but yeah, that's and you know, ESL then came along, <laughs> but I was not with ESL. And ESL back then had their own crew, mostly German, that were doing stuff in English, and I never really got in there. So we started Quad V. Me, Red Eye, Tosspot. Um, a few other guys in the background as well, and that's that was kind of like the next step, right? I, I remember um, that era, man. Tosspot was insane at Casti, yeah. actually. Like, I still think, is, I'm uh, sure. Yeah, I, mean, it, I, I, I would actually pay to watch him cast again a Call of Duty, some some Call of Duty games. So, I mean, 
for, for Tosspot, right, he moved on and did, went to the business side, I'd say fairly early in his career, to be honest. I mean, um, around that time, obviously, Quad V was going on, and then, you know... So in Quad owned... V, it was you, it was Tosspot, it was Demon, right? Uh, yeah, who else was there? A oh, Red Eye? Oh, my God. It's like a... Yeah. It's like the, the all the old school legit guys yeah. together. How how did that go? Um so what a lot of people don't know is that before we started uh, Quad V, or actually I mean I wasn't in there at the, the very start of Quad V. Like I was technically one of the founding guys with them, but they'd already got this idea, they were already working on what this idea should be. Um and then I think it was early two thousand and seven. Um, after WSVG had kind of died off, I saw the opportunity ESL, right? Um, so I decided to fly over to Cologne and do an interview at ESL um, with Jens Hilgers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, that was really eye-opening for me, right? So I, I came into the office. I met, I, I went through the studios. Um, I met, that was the first time that I met Uli Schulze, who's now uh, VP of Pro Gaming at ESL, who oversees all our, all our pro stuff, right? You guys definitely know him, the guy with no hair left. Yes. That's, he, he, he had no hair then, to be fair, so okay. I'm not sure if it's stress-related. It's not like the hairline receded, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I, it, I think he'd already give up on it back then. Um, <laughs> you know, he was, he was commentating as well, along with... Um, Oh, Neoc. Uli was commentating? Yeah, Uli was commentating. I had no idea Warcraft 3, Starcraft, some Counter-Strike. Um, yeah, like a lot of people that are higher up in ESL right now were back in the day, you know, kind of involved in broadcast and, and doing a lot of the cool stuff. I mean, ESL back then was also a, a place where you had 10 jobs, right? That's how ESL, yeah, uh, that's how esports itself started. Uh, yeah. That's how a startup looks. Yeah, Jens told um, me that he was casting StarCraft in German, which yep. I, I, I told him I do not wish to see any clip about that ever. You should burn <laughs> everything. <laughs> there's, there's definitely footage out there. I'm not going to be the one to link it, but there's definitely footage out there of. Um, as I said, all these who are now people who are top executives around in and around esports, right? That uh, that used to commentate. So uh, you can you can if you dig deep enough on the internet, you can find that stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I interviewed for this position. It was um, you know, and you have this system in Germany that really, I mean, it's a good system, and it also for someone like me that's from England is a really shitty ass system. So if you've not done any practical training to become a professional whatever then you have to do that training or you you will be paid accordingly so if you um so what happened was long story short i came here and they said you know you don't have any training as a as a commentator a host or as a as an editorial staff which we did we did it back in the day as well um so you start off like on the lowest pay scale right and for me, that was too little money. Not because I was like, oh, I'm worth these big bucks, but because it was for me to make a move from England and leave everything behind. I knew literally nobody. Um, it was too less. It was just not, I was scared that if I take this, I'm not going to have any money to pay for my rent and eat properly. Right. So I was like, nah, just, I can't take that risk. And that's when we started Quad V. So Quad V, whilst it didn't offer us salaries, um, just because we were this team of people who were right at the top of the game. Like if you wanted the best commentators, they we were all at Quad V. Certainly European-based uh, commentators, anyway. So that was the idea there, right? That we kind of bring everything together and say you have to work with us because otherwise you're not getting the people that you really should have. To, to represent you. And I continued to work on the side and doing events with Quad V up until 2008 when I joined ESL. And obviously before that, a year before that, 2007, when I joined Fnatic. 
as general manager as well. How, how was that? Um, really eye-opening. I have a lot of respect for, for Fnatic as a, an organization because I've seen it on the inside because I was part of it from 2007 <clears throat> to 2008. And I've seen the struggle, you know? I've seen, I've seen the bills coming in and the money to pay them not coming in. Um, I've had to pack the merchandise in and walk it down to the post office myself at the start when we started selling like shirts and you know back then they were sponsored by razor all this razor stuff we would take every single day down to the post office and spending hours just sending shit out um i i saw you know sam matthews obviously the founder of fanatic and still the the big boss man there um you know he he was also developing i don't know if you remember the the social network that they started for, for yeah. gamers you game yeah which you can't find on the internet anymore funnily enough because uh well it's dead um but you know i i saw sam trying to balance between that project that, that had funding and trying to keep fanatic afloat and him trusting us to make decisions when it came to like the big things in fanatic like team changes in the counter-strike team that were like literally the best in the world back then and you know, dealing with player wages, even though we have to somehow balance that out with with something. Um, and I think Fnatic, Fnatic today, if you look at it, I mean, I don't have any or certainly very little insight into how they are um, <clears throat> financially and all that kind of stuff anymore. But from the outside, the look of Fnatic right now is so so different. Like they've as a team over the years, brought Fnatic to a place that's way, way, way better than I ever thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's true. And and what I will say in Fnatic's favor, and it's, uh, which, which we also got told uh, about ourselves, and I actually think the same thing about Cloud9 as well, it's probably the three teams in the world that I see uh, have the most amount of structure which is really rare to see actually in esports. Like you typically, yeah. the teams are incredibly underdeveloped internally. Like they're just mm. chaos. Even if we, if you're talking about any team you have in mind from any NBA franchise that that acquired them or whatever, like it's just a mess inside. And yeah. and at the end of the day, it's a byproduct of the nature of that organization, right? Like you're the you know you're a team. It's a very chaotic kind of. Uh, environment just by default so and most of the money that comes in goes directly to the players anyway and players salaries so finding that you know fine line between yes you you know most of your money has to go to players and deniably if you want to be relevant mm -hmm. uh, but you know simultaneously spending resources on having a staff team that is reliable and and good right that is the fine line that is really hard to find and fanatic found it 100 percent so, yeah. um, I'm glad about back, that too. Back then, right, it, it was super difficult because we 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 had money to spend internally, but there was always this kind of this kind of struggle, which I'm I'm sure is still still a case for you. I mean, you you see, you have this 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 chunk of money to work with, and you can build I don't know an excellent content team around that. Obviously, you already have one; doesn't really apply. But for example, it's fine. Um, you could build, you could spend your money there to just hire 10 really fucking great guys and making content and making your players bigger superstars than they already are. Or you could buy another superstar team. Yep. Literally. Uh, how is, how do I balance that? At what point do I say no to the superstars and hope that my content team aren't filming a bunch of guys that aren't good enough anymore? Yeah. Like this is a, I mean, I don't know if you agree with me on this. I think obviously a lot of knowledge comes in and a lot of research and a lot of um, recommendation and talking to people, uh, you know, and, and this this is part of your structure, right? You, you look down to your coaches to say, this guy has got a potential. Whereas in the olden days, you'd say, I know this guy's got potential, whether it was true or not. But I think there's still a, a large element of luck in there um, in terms of, even if you have the most dedicated, best 
team in the world, there's still a chance that everything can go wrong. Oh yeah, it has gone wrong plenty of times before. And, but yeah, so I 100% agree with you. And not only that, I think that like everybody's looking at data, right? Data meaning, so right now it's hard. Like everybody knows that perks are mid laner is just fucking good, right? That's it. He knows it himself, which means that nobody can strike a really nice deal for the team in terms of salary and overall terms with him because he knows his worth. Um, yep. Simultaneously, nobody can strike an easy deal, a nice deal with us as a team because we will not sell him. Uh, I mean, I think there's no price, right? Uh, yep. So all these things are data. Yes, you can look at data and, okay, this guy's good. If I could get this guy into my team, my team could be good. But then you're too late already if you're looking at that data because everybody else is looking at that data. So then what differences you is to digest some sort of data or understanding of how good a player is or how popular a game is going to become before that happens, right? Yeah. And that is the tough part. And that's what, <clears throat> what most teams are unable to do. Um, now, you can't just have your only strategy to be that, to just find these incredible young stars or incredible games with potential because then there's a chance you fail on 90% of the occasions and then you just have nothing left. So you do have to spend money on the incredibly expensive assets or however you want to call it, players, teams. Um, and, and, and for that, you need to be able to, you know, spend money, more money than you're, that, than you're happy to. Um, and, 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 you know, all of that, it's, here's the problem. The problem is that it's so easy to rationalize everything. Like I could rationalize that it's fine to pay, you know, $4 million every year in salaries for this one team. Because then I can be like, well, I can just then close this one sponsorship for 2.5 and then another one for 2 million. And then, you know, that, like you can rationalize everything. But the, then when it comes to, to the, the moment of truth, experience is the only thing that matters. Because I know for yeah. a fact that in order to close those 4.5 million or whatever uh, in sponsorship deals, I'll need at least 12 months. So what happens in the meantime? It's just a cash flow. Like I'm just wasting, draining money. And what happens if we can't close a partnership? And what happens if the team, you know, underperforms? And like, it's not like the hype from, uh, you know, from the, getting a team lasts forever. Like it lasts two, three months. And then if you don't win, that's it. So all of these yeah. things are question marks and bets you make. And, and you make these bets all the time. And at the end of the day, what makes a team uh, to be... Fnatic or G2 or Cloud9 versus what makes a team be one of the tier three, tier four teams out there is the combination of these many decisions over and over and over, right? Is yeah. that 1% better that is just consistent and compounds? Um, so I agree with you 300%. I think it, interesting for me as well, you know, again, back in the day, and I'm talking about 10 years ago. I mean, that's when I was at Fnatic, right? So I can relate to that 10-year gap that we have. Back then, um, if you were Fnatic or SK um, or maybe MTW back then, you know, like these really big names, like the top three, four, five teams, you didn't have to scout anywhere near as hard as you do now. You didn't need that infrastructure because what you did, you waited for Call of Duty, whatever was coming out, then you watched it for a month, and then you just went out there, slapped out your big wallet, and said, look, you're Fnatic now. And that's how, <laughs> that's how you did it, right? There was no like delving super deep into finding the next superstars and, and all that kind of stuff because the, the, the level of competition at the very top level, money-wise, was, was still quite slim. So you, could, right. you could just go out there and say... Okay, we're fanatic. You want to play for us, don't you? Yes, yep. you do. So, yep. okay, here we go. And I think a lot of teams um, that we could have maybe seen today in terms of organizations, brands, could have survived if that kind of business wasn't normal, right? They, they could have built something up slowly, but because the fact of the matter is, if you had a Counter-Strike team that won three or four tournaments in a row, Someone else that was bigger than you would take them away, and yep. you were not going to be able to hold them. Yep, a hundred percent. I'm super happy that we where we are today. I mean, it means that you have to uh, 
work a little bit harder and give out a little bit more money to your guys, right? But without that, where would the fun be? No, I mean, at the end of the day, man, like these one-year contracts that typically everybody would have and all the contracts running out until the same date and things like that, like that is that is all, like, thankfully, that is all gone. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and we're getting to a point where now player contracts are longer and the tendency is that I think two, three years from now, the average player contract will be 2.5 years. That's more or less for, for the largest games. And, and that already allows you to plan ahead, right? It that allows yeah. you to close sponsorship deals for instead of one year, three years, right? Things like that. Um, so that is the only way this is actually becoming somewhat predictable. Um, and in, in the meantime, until, until we get there, it's just a, it's just a, it's a golden rush. And uh, everybody is just putting as much money as they can. And many, I mean, most of these people that are putting money in are just, they're dumb. They're literally dumb in esports. I'm talking about dumb in understanding the industry. They do not understand why they're doing what they're doing. They come yeah. many times for tra- from traditional sports w- in which, you know, it's a completely different entertainment industry where you can pick up Cristiano Ronaldo and just by picking him up, you create zero content with him. You pick him up, that in by itself will make you sell more tickets, will make you sell more merch. You have to do nothing. Just yeah. get by Cristiano Ronaldo. Here, it's not like that. You buy Faker. If you don't market Faker, he's worthless. He's useless for you as yeah. an organization. Why? Because the way in which you generate value for your partners is through digital, is just through views, right? And, and, and tournaments are not at the level in terms of viewership of traditional sports. Plus you don't have a venue in which you sell tickets to plus the merchandise numbers are nowhere close to those of football or whatever. So at the end of the day, what do you have left? Below the line sponsorship deals. Who is going to give you money unless you actually have truly valuable, you know, static video content, good social media, et cetera. Et cetera. Nobody. So all of no. a sudden you become a media, co- you are you are literally a media company. That's where you are. A media company that has a brand or a number of brands that grow in value over time. That's where you are. And, and yeah, it's just not as easy. You acquired a player and then you have to add on top of it 30% additional costs of marketing the player. And yeah. and that's just brutal. That becomes brutal. And all these people, majority of these teams do not understand this. They just come in with money and they think that whatever works in traditional sports will work here. It doesn't. Then they realize they have a good team, but they have like Twitch as a sponsor. <laughs> it, I mean, it's, it's a massive sinkhole, right? And I think people have been... If you're, if you're, the, the richer you are, the, the, you know, the more you have to play with, the more you're willing to lose before you say stop. True. Um, and I think that's a huge problem, right? I mean, I know Ocelot selling scarves um, back in the SK days, right? Like, that was good. You had, you know, you didn't have a lot, but you also, therefore, I think, treat it differently i think you you know you said okay what what do i do how do i make my move i've got my own scarf a lot of people like oh this is super cool i want to buy an ocelot scarf great you know the scarf became your thing and you you utilized it which i think back then like no no one was even close to even opening their eyes to proper merchandising and 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 seeing how that kind of thing can happen um but you know if you're a an owner of a football team and you know that you've got this huge sinkhole that you can also personally your own funds go into um it's a lot easier to say no that's fine you spend 40 million this year on just player acquisition and and whatever um we'll worry about less the rest later because we can buy the bet like they're almost coming in with the esports attitude of 2007, yes. where I've got more money so yes. I can buy them. Yes. But now bringing it back into this ecosystem, which is way more developed and just won't work, in my opinion. I've, I've seen, I've seen, so th- there, there are teams right now, and you like, be, believe it or not, there are teams from a specific region, organizations from a specific region that are literally losing on a yearly basis 30 million a year. Losing 30 million. You know how much money that is? Like, you know how much, you, like, 
Like how? What is it? How they're spending it? I just fucking don't know how. Like if you try to spend that money, at least here in Europe, it's gonna be tough. Like you need yeah. to get only fakers into the team on every single game. And these teams, believe me, they do not have these kind of fakers. It's just they're completely careless about how they spend the money and things like that. And that is a byproduct of them not being the founders, them just acquiring a team which had certain founders before, which now they don't have skin into the game. Therefore, they don't care about raising more money and getting more diluted. And mm. as a result, they're just not mindful about how they spend the money. They just spend it, right? I, I think it's scary for someone that's been in this business for so long and you know I've seen these these kind of mini bubbles the first one obviously really big one around CGS what happened there right like this money being pumped 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 and a lot of us back then you know I mean I did some stuff for CGS I commentated 2v2 World of Warcraft for CGS didn't have a clue what was going on <laughs> basically basically stole money from them, if I'm being honest because <laughs> Too good carried me through that. Um, oh, Too good is amazing. Fuck, I remember him. I it, yeah. it was it was my favorite World of Warcraft caster. Yeah, I mean that that I was brought in as a last minute replacement. So either way. So do you know anything uh, but, about World of Warcraft? No, nothing at all. So the way, <laughs> no. How do you? I, so the way it worked was, I did the intro to the game. Okay, it's Team X against Team Y. Let's get it on, <laughs> and then. He commentated the whole game, and then at the end, I did the okay team X won, and that's how we cast it. Oh two my two god! World of oh my god, that's crazy. When was this? Two thousand and seven, I want to say. So you, you you've never shied away from a casting games you were not comfortable with, right? No. What was the game um, you enjoyed the most casting? I can tell you the game I enjoyed the least. And that is? A game called Air Rivals. The fuck is that? Um, you may actually remember it. I, I just need to just make sure that they don't exist anymore. I'm pretty sure that game doesn't exist. Air Rivals. Oh, it's now called Ace Online, apparently. Okay. Um, either way, so it was, it was this really weird game that it's kind of like a, you fly in a spaceship around. And it was cool in the fact that you could fly like into the ground and it was tunnels. And it was like 1v1, blow up the other spaceship. But what happened was they flew around and just kind of avoided each other. So I, I, commentated, <laughs> I commentated this final. Um, they gave me a co-commentator and she wasn't great, uh, if I'm being kind. Um, and it, just, it was just terrible. It was... So it was best of three. In the first game, there was one kill. The second game was 0-0. Zero, zero. And the third game, I don't know why we even played it, because the first one was one and the second one was a draw. But we played the third game, and that was a draw. <laughs> so there was one kill in, in this best of three. And somehow, the guy that got the kill lost because he did less damage overall. Oh, wait. Everyone, was, <laughs> there was some drama around it, this, right? Yeah, the it, was before, it was before the League of Legends final at ah. Gamescom. In two thousand and I remember this nine maybe. Holy shit! Ten, like, eleven even. I do I do remember this, and I do remember having watched. Wasn't that it TSM game. SK final? No, I don't think. The TSM. No, TSM had only League of Legends for a. It was the League of Legends. Yeah, it was. It was League of Legends TSM game. Let me just Google this. What was uh, it? What, what, might be difficult these days. Which, which which final was it? It was IEM. IEM, which IEM? TSM will alternate. Which IEM? Because I, I, IEM I, I IEM season six. IEM season six. In which country was it? Cologne. It was a Gamescom. Oh, Cologne, Gamescom. No, that uh, was that was versus. I, oh. It was CLG uh, TSM final. Yeah, CLG TSM. Yeah. I remember that. Oh my god, yeah. I remember that in in uh, in group phase actually. I, uh, I I did a double kill against Reginald and odd one. I remember it. It was insane. I had Cassiopeia, and they ganked me level two, and they both died. I'm just that good. See, from that Gamescom, you remember that, and I remembered 
commentating the worst game that I've ever commentated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what else I remember from that, game, from that Gamescom? Playing SK versus Fnatic in semifinals. Um, and uh, so I remember I had Anivia, and I was against Peke ex Peke with Animid. He had Animid, I was Anivia. And I lost the game with 14-0. I was 14 <laughs> fucking zero, Joe Miller, and I lost the fucking game with Anivia. Okay? You know how tilted I was? Yeah, I can imagine. Production says I mean... KDA player. Why don't you get the fuck out of this building right now? I've never been a KDA. I was flashing in with my Q and all. See, yeah, that was definitely season seven then. Oh, man. Times. Times pass fast. Fast. I mean, that was 2000. 11. That was seven years ago. Jesus. In fact, that was almost to the date seven years ago. The 17th of August. That's, that's just insane. Jesus. So, and what's the game you, you enjoyed the most, actually? Like, let's, just, let's, let's, let's get specific. Because you, you, were, you had these moments in which you, call, uh, you, you casted Call of Duty 4, right? Yeah. Um, of course, Battlefield. Of course, League of Legends. What? What? what do you, of course, some Counter Strike, as well. Um, what do you enjoy the most? Um, it's really hard to say. Uh, if someone asks you, you know, what's your favorite alcoholic drink? Sometimes it's difficult to say. <laughs> it's <a different> is it <laughs> beer? <laughs> See, I'm trying to find an example. That's but... like the most English <laughs> wait, wait, German. <laughs> wait, wait. This is going somewhere. I'm telling you. What's your favorite alcoholic drink? Then you ask him what, uh, like beer, where there's a million different sorts, or or you know, hard drink, long drink, or a cocktail. My point is right that. The games are so different that it's right, and and they've happened at different times over my career that it's difficult to to call it because I think you know when I was so deep inside of Counter Strike, um, in like season three, four, five of IEM, Counter Strike was the best thing that I ever commentated, and after Counter Strike, I went to League of Legends, and I I remember specifically where the change happened, and that was. Season one finals at DreamHack, where I did League of Legends instead of commentating Counter Strike. That was the that was the the changeover for me, um, and I absolutely loved it. I loved League of Legends back then. Like I was actually enjoying playing the game, which was something new. Um, it was actually something that I said I'd never do, which was uh, commentate League of Legends because I I was enjoying playing it. And there's a difference between commentating a game and playing a game a lot like to commentate a game you have to go so much deeper you have to watch so much you have to read so much you have to you know you have to play even more than you did when you when you were enjoying it and i was scared that league of legends for me as a game for kind of like my hobby was going to be ruined by commentating it um i mean that's did that did happen funnily enough but way down the line um but once i started commentating league of legends like this was a whole new thing for me like the 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 genre like doing mobile i'd never played dota before so i was i was totally new to this this kind of game um and it's so different to counter-strike like commentating counter-strike obviously you have rounds so you have like this this slow build up per round and then a, a, an intense ending usually to a round and that over and over and over again. Whereas in League of Legends, you, know, you had a, a 40 minute game, let's say, and it was 20 minutes of less interesting stuff, uh, sometimes really, really boring stuff. <laughs> uh, and then like these big explosive team fights that could, like, you know, one or two of them could end the game. You had base races, like, I oh, mean, that was amazing. You know, you know out, all too out. well uh, about stuff like that. <laughs> um, and that kept, like that pace for me in League of Legends was like it 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 really kind of invigorated my my um, will to to keep commentating because you know I'd been doing a lot of Counter Strike. Um, I was commentating Counter Strike with uh, Matt Ryder and Too Good who were doing World of Warcraft as well. Matt Ryder, Once they left, 
Yeah. Once I left ESL, I just did everything on my own. So I was literally sat in the studio almost every single night, producing on my own and commentating for like IEM shows or uh, ESL Meisterschaft, as it is now back then, ESL Pro uh, Pro Series, like the the German National Championship, plus this, that, the other. And I'd like kind of burnt myself out because I was doing all the events and I was just hardcore at it once again, but on my own. So like coming into League of Legends and then having Demon to work with again, who I'd not worked with for like years, it felt like, was like this big, wow, this is great. This is like, do, do, do I, you I'm, think, I'm hyped again. Do you agree with me that you and Demon had probably the best casting duo in esports of all time? Um, like everybody's, I, think, I mean, if you would, let's imagine for whatever reason, you would just cast one game of League of Legends at some point, just randomly. People would be like, I'm pretty sure viewership could grow 20, 30% just from that. Because there's so many people just dying for a casting duo like that. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> if you'd have taken us like at the level where we stopped and how everyone was then, I'd have said, um, aside from Monty and Doa, absolutely. I still think that, um, I mean, it, it depends on your style and what you like. Um, obviously, me and Demon were high energy, a lot of play-by-play, a lot of humor involved. There was Neither of us were, were a particularly good analytical League of Legends True. mind, right? Neither like of us that, were, actually. were really super deep into it, which is great for... Um, you know, a lot of newer players, I think a lot of newer players appreciate that. I think a lot of pro players, like on the level you were back then, appreciate that as well because you already know. Like, you don't need me to tell you why that's good when then I might be wrong anyway uh, because I'm not that, yeah. I'm not as Quarter good as you. Quarter typically more shit than anybody else. Yeah, but the, the real problem is, like, this, the tier between, I don't know, I don't know maybe gold and uh, what's the... What's he called in League of Legends these days? I'm sure so that question is coming silver, up. Silver, gold, platinum, diamond, master, challenger. Master, master, challenger, yeah. Like, up to, between gold and master, right, you've got these people who are like, they think they know everything, but actually they don't know even a fraction of what <laughs> yeah. it, a pro player knows. Like, the, yeah. the, the level is there. And they're way better than me at the game, so how could I even I agree with hope you. to get to the pro level? And I think that's something that Monty really dedicated his life to, right? Which is watching every minute detail, talking to a lot of people, like kind of asking people why this happened, why why do you go that direction? Why does why does this work better than that? And and just the sheer amount of watching games that he wasn't involved in. Um, I think he was an analyst that had not played that game, like Deficio for me is like the Deficio and, and Jat as two very prime examples of people who have been at the top level or be now a while, certainly a while ago, but they came in with that understanding that no other commentator had because no other commentator had, 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 had hammered it that hard and been that good and, and played in tournaments that good. So I think it's very much a a preference thing, very much kind of a style thing, as if you found me and Demon to be the to right. be the best pair. Got it. I mean, if you if you look at it by the end, like the last, I guess two seasons of LCS, me and Demon didn't commentate together anymore. The only chance that we ever got to commentate together was if we did a tricast and had a third person in there. Um, what I do believe though is that if if we'd have stayed in League of Legends and have you know, still be working on League of Legends to this day, I think would be better than any other caster that's ever casted any other game. Not, I'm saying not because we um, are more naturally skilled or work harder than anyone else. I think just this period, bear in mind the, the last League of Legends game that I ever commentated was 2014. Oh. That's four years ago. Like, well, it, was, it was in Worlds, right? Yeah, it was in Worlds in Korea. Uh, that's four years ago. Like, if I'd have continued four years and done the amount of LCS that's been there and the amount of big 
tournament finals and stuff that I'm, I'm sure I would have got to do some of them. Like, I do believe that my skills right now would be incredible. Um, as it was, though, I was kind of burnt out. I think the, the LCS system and how it was working back then just totally killed it for me. Yeah, the, I, I, well, one thing I agree with you is, and there's good and bad on this, is that the Riot Games definitely changed the game in regards to how esports is watched and how, yeah. you know, titles have kind of this tournament system and things like that. Because we were used to have these very chaotic, but also very fun tournament, you know, tournament by tournament kind of system. Which allowed, you know, sometimes you would have shitty tournaments because, you know, they may not even pay the prize money, right? Yeah. And that's the ugly side. But sometimes you would have, you know, I am Hanover one week. Then you have um, whatever other tournament happening in the following week. And they both would be amazing. And, and that kind of chaos, we don't have it anymore in some of these games. And I think that... And at the end of the day, I understand, of course I understand why Riot moved the direction they moved, because you need to be able to predict kind of which games are playing where, are played where, and yep. everything needs to make sense business-wise. Uh, you can't just be traveling and playing in different venues around the world for the for year-round, because you won't have the cash for it. And at the end of the day, this is all a business, right? But on the other hand, it is true that myself as a player, actually, you know, I, I, I deliver the best and I had the most amount of fun when it was this chaotic tournament by tournament approach uh, where I could just, right after the tournament, two, three days after, I mean, during two, three days, I would just still play, but taking it very easy. You know, I would just watch some movies or, you know, play a little bit then watch some movies then go with my friends out or just meet some girls or whatever. And then the problem is that you know, I mean, and then, you know, three days after I started training again, and then one week before the tournament, it's just full try hard. And everybody just practices 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day for one week before the tournament. Now, I mean, when the, when the, the tournament system shifted, then it was no longer like that. It was a constant, you know, stream of important games. Every single week, you had a couple of games, every single week. Yeah. And that is just, that takes a toll on you because, yeah, you did not play on Sundays, and Sundays nobody screamed. But can you really take the day off knowing that six days from now you have the next game that you have to be incredibly prepared for? Actually, five days from now. Mm. That's brutal. So, yeah. yeah, that takes a toll. And I, I, and it's the same for shortcut. It's any any talent related to to the to the game itself. Just it just takes a toll on you because you can't just watch replays on Sunday. I mean, you can, but it, you, at some point, it's like a hammer in your brain. Boom, 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 boom. And then you, yeah. one day you'll break. Is that the reason why you quit League of Legends? Um, one of two reasons. Um, to, to kind of stay on that topic first before talking about the other bit. Um, so, you know, I got a lot of backlash on, on Twitter and on Reddit about when I said, you know, I don't like the, the way that we did things. So... Back then, and I, I know for a fact that this has changed, that we had a very structured uh, kind of life at that point. You know, with on a Monday at 11 a.m., and I'm sure my timings and everything are all, all wrong by now, but just to give you kind of a general idea of what it was like, you know, you'd have a, a kickoff meeting on a Monday where you'd highlight what the big stories were from last week, what the big stories were from this week, and then you start writing your, your script stuff. And yes, we did write scripts, and I know the whole scripted meme came kind of from that discussion. But back then, we did definitely write scripts and definitely did have writers, which I know for a fact got less for us over time. You know, we, we were trusted more to, to do our own content, and a writer was only really there to say, maybe you could say it this way, or maybe you could say it that way. Actually, at the start, we had problems that it was being written for us, and we were saying, no, that's not how I would talk. I, I wouldn't say it like that. So it, it's, it's flipped over in the other direction, which I think is good for everyone, good for the show, good for uh, everyone working on it as well. Uh, but it was kind of like, you know, you know, you'd do this kickoff on a Monday, then you'd write some scripts, and then on Tuesday you'd do 
VOD review and in the evening you'd have a call with the, the guys in NA and go through this. And it's kind of like this step-by-step-by-step -step -step thing. And then you come into the show on a Thursday, uh, yeah, on a Thursday, do your show, go home late, come in Friday morning, script call, go through your script, do a read-through of your script, start the show, do the show, go home. And that was it. That was what we did for weeks and weeks and months and months and months and for years, actually, then. And as I said, it did get better, but I still felt by the end that I was... You know, a lot of people said that is what it is. That's, that's, that's a sports job. That's, that's what you get if you do this kind of job. I don't fully agree with that. I know that obviously there are some jobs that, I mean, if you're a newsreader, that is literally your fucking boring ass job. It, you couldn't pay me enough money to be a newsreader. Um, unless it was like fake news. I think that'd be a really cool job, like a fake newsreader. <laughs> I think I've just given someone a great idea for a YouTube channel. It probably already exists. So I'm like probably five years behind. No, no, um, no, but, nowadays you can just read news and, and, and a lot of it will be fake anyway. So, <laughs> well, yeah, you got the job by default. Exactly. Um, and in the end, it just, you know, the games weren't different enough for me. The, it was a, the same teams week in, week out. And I know people say that's what happens when it's a league. Yes, of course. Um, but it just got to the point where I just felt like I wasn't progressing. Like I was, because I was a little bit bored with the repetitiveness of everything, I felt like I was pulling my colleagues down a little bit like it wasn't fair for me to commentate deficio when i know like deficio at the start and i'm sure still is like he watched everything that was that was being played he watched every single region he was up for na uh watching na late he was up early when uh you know lpl and lck were on and all he watched literally everything he was constantly researching playing when he somehow had time between all of that and actually doing his job. And I felt like it wasn't fair on, on someone like uh, Deficio to kind of turn up because that was, that was my way out, right? To how did I make it fresh? I made it more uh, ad-lib. I, I kind of said, I'm not going to write too much about this. I'm just going to talk about it when I get there. So what I'd often do is rather than being... 100% factual on things I'd miss the stats out I'd leave the stats away so that I couldn't be wrong and I'd give more opinion which sometimes worked out sometimes didn't but I, I tried on my own to kind of freshen it up a little bit and, and do it more of a way that would make me happier and hopefully kind of re-spark this, this love for what I was doing um, the only time that I really got a buzz in the last two years of doing League of Legends was at events. When the crowd was there, um, like that that final, the last final that I did, the uh, 2014 in the stadium in Seoul, I already kind of knew by then that it wasn't going to go, I wasn't going to move to Berlin, right? Um, and actually, after the winning moment, once we passed it to the stage and they had their moment with the trophy and all that kind of stuff. I kind of just walked away a little bit to the side away from everyone. And I actually like cried for a bit. Like I, I, I stood there for 10 minutes and cried because I kind of knew that this is the moment that I live for, but I couldn't keep doing the rest of the stuff to get to this point. Like, I, I didn't, I, I couldn't put myself through another, 50 weeks, I mean, obviously a season's not that long, but uh, whatever it is, 20 weeks, 30, 40 weeks in a year with two seasons to get to this World Finals moment just to enjoy that buzz. You know, what I wanted then was if someone had said to me, next season, LCS is going back to every three weeks, an event is pl it's all done by Riot, so we control everything still, but we're, you know, we're going to do this road show. Every single week, every single or oh, every third week, we're in a different city, stadiums, fans in there, high energy, all this stuff. I would have said, I'm staying for another year. But I knew that was not going to be the case. So uh, I decided to call it quits. Yeah, it's, oh man, it's, I don't know what to tell you because 
the truth is that it. Like, I think you're right. I mean, I, I, I think you're right in the sense of some of it was very good about that chaos, but I know that it's just sad that I know that it can't be like that. I just know it yes. can't. Uh, so, and, and I don't know, I, I guess we are right now, I think the main problem is that we are, or especially in that time, like four years ago, up, up since, you know, since four years ago until probably two years from now, those six years, more or less, it's like um, you're in nowhere's land. You're in like a limbo in terms of, in terms of yeah, you play offline, but the venues are not that pretty. The energy is not that high because mm -hmm. if everybody's just going there every week and there's nothing special happening, right? There's no rivalry. Like the teams that are part of the USCS right now, by the way, like there's just a couple of them that is just nice, fun to be with because they take banter and they just are fun. One of them is Fnatic, which we like to piss off every single week and they respond, thankfully. But most of the others are just parasites and they just, it's just annoying to just share the same league with them and it just makes it boring you know so i think that during this six years period like i think it's gonna last a couple of years more you know that boredom that you find when the same thing seems to be happening like, you know, there's no fresh there's no fresh feeling week after week and for so many weeks and that leads to lower viewership overall that will change the moment that uh, production quality, actually, no, that's not the word, but venue quality and venue frequency will change and uh, we improve. Once you have every single month, one stop on a city or something like that, and then you fill out even 8,000 seats, which is not the, it's not that crazy. Like 8,000 seats in a top game, you fill it uh, once a month, I'm, I'm yeah. sure then you're talking different things because there is like is the thrill of seeing the people's faces like the thrill you know there's a reason why the best construct players in the world can still afford to before a major tournament before an IEM or something like that or an ESL1 take uh three four days off and those three four days off are key because then they yeah. return and they're fresh their interviews are nice they just, it's fun, you know? Like you, when you watch this, again, I'm gonna call it chaotic. Chaotic um, system is just fun. Every time you watch a tournament, there's something new happening. And yeah. people have different energy. The shoutcasters have different energy. It's just fresh, you know? And I get it, right? I get it, right? And I think the Riot's done a lot to to help i mean this has got kind of two sides to it right that all this extra content that they're doing like the the talent and doing podcasts and, right, and all yeah. this kind of stuff Started recently. Right? for me like that's I, that's something i wish that we were given the chance to do back then which okay again you can argue i never really took the initiative there to to do that kind of thing on my own true um but i wish i had that kind of push from from someone behind me to say hey joe you know i get it i we we get that this kind of schedule can be repetitive why don't we try doing something cool why don't you go you know go visit a player or, his, or a team at their house every week and or take them out for a beer or whatever i don't care but you know just just something that was in there it was it's there, it's I, there I, now. I hear you i hear now. you it's, it's now, super cool. I, I will say that right now i do feel like there's a change definitely uh, in the right direction and the EU team especially yeah. the EU team of ULCS uh, uh, you know quick shot shocks like these guys are doing an incredible job actually at yeah it and, that's, and I want to say that as well like make that really 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 especially after what I said earlier about if I'd have stayed there then I, I genuinely think that I would have been the best commentator in the world um, the guys doing EU LCS I know for a fact how much they put into it like I see shocks fairly regularly. I know exactly how hard it is to be in the position that they are. Um, you guys out there, you fans literally have to worship those guys because if those guys go, like losing me and Demon, whatever, you know, losing Doa Monty, a couple of guys here this year, here that year, whatever, 
if you see like three or four guys drop out of that EU LCS team, it'll not be fun. It'll take a while until you get back up to that kind of level because you can't find those kind of personalities around. Um, they need years of training. They need to be, you know, a certain way. They need to be certain kind of people. And I think the, the EU LCS team right now, I'll, I'll be very open. I don't watch any NA LCS, so I can't comment on it. Um, EU, EU LCS team for me is is really good at what they do. They're, they're fantastic at what they do. Their, their level of commentary right now is better than the level of commentary when I stopped, is my point. So while it's it's always nice to hear, you know, hey, Joe and Demon, when are you coming back to LOL? Da, 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 da. Realistically, that's never going to happen. And realistically, you need to support the people that you have there now because they're really, really good. And uh, you don't want to lose them, whether you know it or not. Fair, fair, enough. fair enough. I think everybody, many people agree with you. And, and people like, to, I didn't know that people like to, yeah, I, I tweeted this thing the other day. Um, it's a it's a quote from Joe uh, Joe Rogan. He says, "People nowadays like to be recreationally outraged." And uh, like that yeah, quote I'm, is insane. I'm bored. What can I do? I'm pissed off. Exactly. Like they just they just wake up and open up social media with the will to find flaws in the system or with the will to find negativity or something bad to say about somebody. And right now both the North American LCS team and the USCS team get a lot of shit in Reddit. And I think this is just a byproduct. Like, there's nothing going on. As a matter of fact, I think the tendency is insanely good if you compare it with a couple of years ago. Um, like, really, really good. But people just like to, they just enjoy being pissed. It's unbelievable. Is, yeah. there, is there entertainment? Uh, the thing is, I don't think that changed, though. Like, I... <laughs> I, I don't think, you know, when I when I left there and, and stopped going to League Reddit, because, I mean, I only used to go there because it was a way to see how terrible you were on that oh. day, you know? It was kind of, it, you went there to, if you fancied a bit of self-punishment, then you thought, you know, I'll load up Reddit <laughs> and, and, and check out the I would read it every threads. day, man. I would read it every single day. And I would get yeah. so shadowed and sometimes so praised. It's so ridiculous, man. It's just... It's it's super polarized, but again, I, I still think that you've got to you've got to take some notice of it, but you've got to have like a thick enough skin to to be able to read it, read what they mean, try and like extract what minute bit of useful detail is there, and discard the hate and the bullshit and the just frankly it's made up stuff. Yeah. And just like kind of just leave that and then move on, right? Which is. <laughs> I mean, if every human being was like that, we'd be in a much more peaceful, happy place. How, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that hatred from? Because the casters actually get shot on, like get get really a lot of flack, a lot. Um, I think it's, and this is something that I I hope I brought a lot to to people that I've worked with at ESL that have worked in my team. You know, like people like Pansy, who's an oh, amazing. She's amazing. She's insane. She's, she's she's one of the best in the world, without any doubt. She gets a lot of flack purely because she's a woman in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. and purely because she's not people's favorite. And this is this is like this weird thing in esports. I see Dota commentators talking about it a lot when like TI announcement comes out, right? And this is this is a theme that I wish like more people could adopt, which is you know just because it's not your favorite commentator doesn't mean you should hate on who it is. Just because, you know, your Joe's not there doesn't mean you should say that your quick shot's terrible or vice versa or any mix of those, right? It's That's just some, like, weird thing that we seem to have developed over over years. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that's one thing that I've hoped teach a few people that have worked with me where we've done kind of reviews on not just techniques and, and and how to cast well and when to take a breath when to pause when to really ramp up when to you know just blow your head off basically because you have to be able to do that as well we talked a lot about how to ignore the haters and i still think it's something that not a lot of people can do i don't think there's 
there's there's different degree of severity, right? I think if someone hates you because they say you're a you're shit to your caster, then for me, I can throw that away. If someone says, I don't like Joe because he's English and fat, I'm like, that's fucking bullshit because <laughs> how, how do I improve? Do you even want me to improve or do you just want to insult me? Yeah. Like that's the, that's the two, that's, that's what I mean about going in there, picking out whatever useful. By the like, way, for what's worth, I think you look very athletic, Joe. Uh, that'd be great if it were the case. Um, big chest. <laughs> definitely do in like both wide and I'm talking about yeah. muscle. I've touched that before. I've touched both the right and the left one. And uh, even though there is, it's, they're not similar because the left one it outsizes the right one. I have to say that those, those are two very nice pecs. True. Actually, it's true. Actually, <laughs> this, is, see, this is, this is how, That's this is how often me and Carlos right have, have spent time together from, <laughs> In in all kind of places that you guys are never gonna find out. And, <laughs> you maybe know, I'll I, 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 maybe I, I'll write a book one day. No, and like, no, do not, I do not. No, write no. Books. Listen, it'll obviously be like that typical autobiography where you say name redacted. Uh, oh, I like that. So like, you'll definitely know <laughs> not know who Juan Carlitos <laughs> is when I talk about this. Person. When you talk in about this night, this night in <laughs> Moscow, there's a guy called Sombrero that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah um I, i remember a few of those i think uh, you know joe i think we had a lot of fun and uh, there's still a lot of fun left but uh, i think the best you know, time the great we, we thing is it. You, you remember a few of those but actually it's the ones that you don't remember that were the most <laughs> yeah, fun. i remember i remember many of those which i don't remember uh, exactly and, and and those are uh, epic epic yeah. epic epic with the, with some of the esl team With uh, Rotterdam as well, uh, yeah. some of the great people, and that's that's um, something that I think people like really underestimate about working in esports, right? Is the the camaraderie, and I think I think that changed as well in League of Legends and in LCS with the change from Cologne to Berlin. That you know we used to have we used to have a great atmosphere in Cologne where after games or after the obviously the the weekends done. There'd be time. There'd be time where we socialize with each other. There'd we always be time went to this we... place. How's it called? I can't. I can't let you in on on secret information. Oh, yeah. but I'm oh, sure it's you'll. True. Yeah, I can't. Oh my god, I was about to say. I'm sure. I'm sure you'll find it at some point if you've not already done so in Cologne. <laughs> yeah, um, we but... were increasingly finding more and more fans in that place. It was. It was exactly. Get, it was getting busted. Yeah, exactly. But it, you know, it was. It was nice to have a few players from each team to come along after the games and kind of relax and wind down. And, you know, only from what I've heard from, from a lot of players and stuff, actually, rather than, rather than talent, that that's just not the case. And that was my worry. Like, Cologne is this tiny, tiny place. Unless you've got, like, a terrible manager, fanatic back then. Uh, I'm not saying that their manager was terrible, but I'm just saying his decision was terrible to put them like, I don't know how far away. Yeah, I remember but it that. Was it was like 30 minutes far by away. And that sucked for those guys. I mean, they still took a cab, right? But um, that was that was my worry with Berlin. And I guess I was kind of right about that, that it's just so big and so spread out Sorry. that you, you lose that kind of... Uh, camaraderie it, it is a very nice city though i i do like that berlin you know when i when i lived in cologne there when you know the lcs for a year and a half approximately i i actually hated cologne the only thing i liked about cologne is two things first of all that kind of camaraderie that you just mentioned is good after games but it depends if i won then it was fun if i lost then i was i wasn't just not going out and i was feeling miserable yeah. at home instead uh but and then second was i was always running um around the river i run um six miles seven miles every you know, three three times a week approximately and that river man the you know the, the bridge and all that that was beautiful 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 stuff um i don't think i've ever done i've ever run anywhere better actually and i, I one thing i remember as well is the squash games with mr alex Mueller, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the general manager of sk gaming He actually, he's fucking good, by the way, at squash. Yeah. He's really, really good. Like... I heard that. And he, and he's, he's competitive. I mean, I, I, I used to play paddle professionally. Like, paddle is, is not the same, but it's like 
racket thing, right? So, so it's not that different. And uh, and and I thought I was gonna destroy him. And I think we were like, we, we ended up like, he won more games than I did at the end. So he's like really, really good. He was like try harding, like jumping into the ground and like super try hard, super, super try hard. Um, so I have good memories, but for the most part, I just don't know what that, why that is, but it feels like German people in general are too rude for what I'm used to. And maybe not rude. That's not the word because I've come to learn that it's not just being rude. It's just being uh, overly German. yeah, pragmatic. <laughs> like the German way of communication is effective, is pragmatic, and, and yeah, very direct, right? And for somebody from Spain, where everybody is just going around the bus just to explain you what's up and, you know, it's just, it's just very different. So it just shocked I, me. I think that that changed for me when I became good enough to have a conversation in German, right? Yeah, I, I like, bet. I think that's, I mean, you're right. Like, there are some things that, I mean, I've been in Cologne for 10 years now almost. Um there are some things that still drive me like batshit crazy as they did on day one, which is like, you know when you open a door for someone, you see them coming, so you, you, you're friendly. This is something that we do in England a lot. You, you open the door, even if they're like too far away, so they have to run a little bit like because they feel awkward, but you still open the door anyway. And the thing that you hate most as an Englishman is when they just walk through, they walk past you through the door and don't say thank you. Oh my like, God. That's, the most annoying thing that I, that I have in Germany, seriously, and the same as uh, like all, holding the, the the tram doors open for like someone when you can see, okay, he's like running across the road, dodging cars, jumping over the barrier <laughs> to get into the tram, and you hold the door open for him because you're a nice person, and then he just walks on and doesn't say anything. Oh no! And I'm just always like, thank you, asshole. Yeah. <laughs> but, there are two examples of things that annoy me in Germany. Yeah, service also in restaurants and things like that. I, I, that's something yeah, it's I... It's also I, terrible. Yeah, I, I enjoy... I mean, the reason I go to a restaurant is not to eat better because you can probably eat equal, if not better, at home. Uh, it's because of the service. You just want to sit down, you want to relax, be with somebody, chat. Somebody takes care of you, right? That's a yeah. service you pay for. And here they got it completely wrong. Like yeah. they just got it wrong. Here is like, it's pure entitlement. You know, it's like, oh, you should be lucky that I want to serve you. You know, like uh, it's it's different. Let's just say it's they, different. They didn't get the memo when it comes to you know, you call the waiter, which means you have to wait on me. You're, <laughs> yeah. You 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 have to waiter. come to me. <laughs> I'm I'm right now the waiter because I've been trying to get my bill for like half an hour, but yeah. you're just ignoring me because no, I, I, honestly, I I learned, I learned I learned now like. Whenever I want to pay, I just learn the lesson. I just turn up and go to the <laughs> cashier. Yeah. And sometimes they'll get pissed. Well, I have to wait for me to come. Okay, yeah. well, then, then uh, just please come whenever you're ready. <laughs> is, I mean, you just give up at some point. So what have you been doing in the last three years? Um, like, it, walk us through how your job developed and what do you do today? So once, once I decided that you know, by the way, I was one, uh, one, one second. Uh, Joe, yeah. could I get water, please? Mm -hmm. Thanks, man. I yeah. have to get my own water just so we're clear. Yeah, it's like my Coca Colas are finished. And this is, this is, a, I don't know. We don't get sponsored by Coca Cola, by the way. Like, this is just me being addicted. So, and I was speaking yesterday with somebody. You know that every single Sunday I will eat. A Big Mac, um, uh, uh, two double cheeseburgers, two cheeseburgers, um, nine chili cheese bites or chili cheese nuggets, however it's called in, 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 in McDonald's. They copied it from Burger King. Plus an apple pie, plus um, two large fries. That's like a bomb of three point whatever thousand yeah. calories. And I, I, every single Sunday, okay? And after eating all of that, I always feel like, oh, this is the last time. But every single Sunday, same thing happens. So somebody told me, like, that shit must have nicotine. Like, it must have some stuff. That, <laughs> it must have something that 
makes you crave and you would think that with how big the thanks man with how big the the brand mcdonald's is anybody would like really call it out but like so far it's like just there right but i'm sure like 300 percent sure it has stuff that makes you want more uh, shortly after taste it just tastes amazing like let's be honest this is insane if if you i mean for me that's the same with like everything though like if something that i like if you drink it like or if you if you eat it um irregularly enough then it still tastes good if you like go overboard right if you say if you do mcdonald's often, every day nope yeah then you like uh, then you have to take like some time out yeah so it's kind of, that's like this this moderation thing going on but yeah moderation no, that's a nice word Unhealthy stuff is also healthy in moderation. You just gotta learn how to moderate. I I found out with with uh, with esports that I have a very addictive nature, so I have to always uh, put myself in check. Like I have to play tricks, you know. Like um, I don't know uh, if if for whatever reason, uh, I mean I've been working from home, I ever I mean until a year and a half ago, and the reason I was so effective is because. I would do fucking crazy shit to to not to to keep at work. I would for mm -hmm. example um at the end of each day I would put the computer which is an it's a it's really heavy in a different room, right? And say, you know, so that you don't have an easy way to get into a computer because if anything happens that you just don't want to deal with, you just go into your other computer to your playing computer and you play games mm -hmm. or whatever, right? So I did that once and I told myself this has never happened again, you know? So I just had to trick myself, put the computer in a different room and <laughs> then I and then I wanted to play and then I'm like, yeah, CBA, you know? Like the computer is like whatever, 20 kilograms. Like I'm not gonna- Not pick. gonna do it. Exactly. And then you just stay, no. stay at work. So, and, and that's a stupid example, but I do it with everything. I have a very, very addictive nature. <laughs> Except with Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola and yeah. McDonald's, those are my guilty pleasures. Yeah. So you, 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 you what were saying. What was the question? Yeah. Three years, ago, we went three off years on a... ago to now, what were you doing and how did your career develop and what do you do today? So, um, yeah, when I, when I didn't go to Berlin, I started off as the, I think technically my title was editor in chief at ESL TV. Um, what it mostly consisted of was number one, um, looking after all our studio bookings. So um, in our old office, which you obviously were at, I don't know if you visited our new one, but definitely we were at the old one. Uh, we had like three or four different studios, in fact, five studios, um, which we used almost daily, depending on what was going on at what time. So I managed all the, the logistics of them, making sure the ones that needed a producer had a producer, um, making sure that there were enough people around to, to commentate each of them, each show and what have you, uh, but also manage then our internal talent team. So um, back then was Apollo, Mitch Leslie, who's now on Overwatch League, Demon, Machine, who's obviously doing a lot of Counter-Strike, Pansy, Jason Kaplan, Kalaris, Todd, so I had like... Where's Jason now? Jason's um, still with us technically as a... Uh, were his agent, um, but no longer full-time for us. I'd okay. say no, no one from uh, our HQ that was so Demon, Pansy, uh, Kalaris, uh, Jason, they're, they're all freelance and we just work together on a kind of agency level, right? I see. Um, so that's, that's what I've done for the last three years. I spent kind of a year in between also working with our MCN team, our media network team to look after YouTubers and try and try and bring the the influencer side and the, the talent side of esports a little bit closer together. Make sure that, you know, not all those influencer deals were going to, to just to YouTubers but also coming into esports people as well. Um so that's that's kind of an interesting part of my job, but a lot of it these days is very much agency kind of making sure that I'm 
offering out the right commentators to the right events, uh, making sure that everyone's getting paid properly, making sure that um, ESL events have enough commentators for them and the right commentators. So every single big ESL event that you see, I book the commentators for as well. Amazing. Do you that's, enjoy that's this more than casting? Um, yes and no. Again, it's like totally different, right? So I think at that point at Riot, I was, I mean, let's not make a mistake. I think a lot of people don't, don't know this, but whilst I was working with Riot, I was actually fully employed by ESL the entire time. So I, I didn't technically move anywhere. I just kind of shifted roles a little bit. Um, and when that all went down with Riot moving to Berlin and me not following, I think I wanted to get a little bit more on my CV that wasn't just commentary, right? That wasn't just, I'm good in front of a camera and why? I can well, talk Why do well. you feel like you wanted to have more stuff? First person oh, who managed bring, just bring to on. open the door, bring despite the sign Who's on that? the door, gets to come on the G2 podcast. His name is Waze Imran. You should go <laughs> and bully him on the internet. Now he feels terribly bad. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is that we had we had plans for this. That's like two hours. I can't I can't believe. I mean, oh, two, two people already? at least. Two people definitely did stop and look at the door and then walk away. But he <laughs> managed to completely avoid that one. Um, where was I? Yeah. So I wanted to get like more more practical real world i suppose um stuff on my cv like if i stop esports after that after the riot job right my cv looks great if i want to be a commentator for anything if i want to be a project manager on something outside of esports my cv looks pretty thin like I used to commentate video games, and at some point, I worked in an aquarium shop selling fish. It's yeah, basically. I, I don't think uh, you can you can use shirt casting <laughs> with with fish. <laughs> exactly, it, it didn't quite work out. Um, obviously, in esports, I I don't have any worries because I think that I'm well known oh, enough. You're past. You're past that point. I think people know what I can do, and I've interacted with enough people. To that they know what my what my skill sets at least may be with the experience that I have, um, but I wanted to kind of have this on paper. I wanted to have this experience of you know developing people. I wanted to sounds really cheesy, but I wanted to give back to mm -hmm. like the next generation of commentators as well, right? So you know, seeing someone like Pansy develop over the last three years. Whilst you know giving us some tips, um, another one, Mitch. Uh, uh, and, but, but, hang on, like, I think I think Pansy is like I, I don't know. Why, like, I have a crush with the way she comments. It's insane. Like like I think the voice is she has is insane. Like she has this Janis Joplin like. So it's a fucking amazing, and I'm a big fan of Janis Joplin. You know, maybe maybe that's why. But like the the emphasis, the way like, it's just insane i think she's one of the best shortcasters right now by far like it, whatever gender i don't care like it's just insane yeah and what you know what a big thing about it is i want to kind of help people have what i didn't so in 2003 four five yes there was you know red eye and demon and and everyone around but we were kind of growing up together and figuring out what's the best and what we're worth as a group. Now there's there's so many people aspiring to be commentators and there's not many people that are experienced enough and, and willing, which is a big part of it, to actually tell them, look, this is what you're worth. Send me your, your demo. Let me hear it. Let me tell you this is good. This is bad. This is terrible. Don't ever do that again, but do more of this. Um, I think that's like a really important thing for me. Like I, I've said this on Twitter a few times and a, a lot of people have utilized it as well. If you ever want advice when it comes to commentating, when it comes to, you know, how much you should be worth, because a lot of people, they'll, they'll commentate in their bedroom like I did back then. And they'll be able to do qualifiers and things like that where they'll learn, I don't know, 
anywhere from 20 euros per map in Counter-Strike mm -hmm. up to whatever, right? Mm -hmm. But when they f finally get their first event, they don't know what they're worth. Without like having the, the peers that have also done events tell them what they earn, they don't know. And for me, that's, that's one big thing that I, I like to set a standard on, that it's not very often and only in very, very special cases that I'll go, that I'll hire someone for less than a certain threshold. Because I believe that that's the minimum that someone should be earning for the position that they have and for the job that they're doing. There are a lot of companies out there that if you tell them that you want 50 euros a day to do a live event, they will take you for 50 euros a day to do that live event. For me, that's not the right way. Never, never has been. I've had to struggle through that myself, and I hope that I can kind of help other people, you know, skip those bullshit years that I had of trying to figure it out. For sure. And, and it trims their growth, their career growth as well, because at the end of the day, like, there's a minimum salary that you can withstand a normal life. Yeah. And, and anything below that will make your will make your job suffer, your creativity suffer, and this is shitty long term because you'll get pissed at everything. It just it just trims everything yeah. you want the person for. So it's even good I mean, for for the company. It's it, I also you know and and I've done this to exactly two people, um, who weren't good enough. Had spent a long time trying to figure out how how to get better and and it, it, this is actually like really hard for me because i know how bad some people want it right like if you want people always say if you want something bad enough you can achieve it i don't fully buy into that statement there are people who want some things incredibly hard that they you know that they that they want to achieve but they don't have the the base there, the 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 skill set. And if you if you dedicate your life to something, but it takes you too long to get there, maybe not too long, but you don't see a clear I'm getting better, I'm I'm progressing, then I think at some point for your for your kind of your own welfare, you have to say, look, maybe I move and do something else. So it's it's really it's, it's really hard for me because I, I came from that idea of if I want this hard enough, I'll get there, right? So it's, yeah, it's hard for I, me I, to, I to, to kind of tell somebody, like, <laughs> don't hate me, but I don't think that you're going to reach the level that you want. Like, that you, if you're happy to do this as a hobby and then a little bit on the side and do it for fun, go for it, man. Like, keep going, keep pushing, keep doing what you're doing. Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe in five years you're at a level where you could be hired by external companies and do events. But I've had to do it, as I said, to 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 two people that asked me for advice, where my advice literally was either do this for a hobby or try out something else. Maybe you you maybe you're gonna be big in esports. Maybe you just try and you do it in a wrong game or in the in the wrong path, right? Maybe you maybe you can go out there and make awesome content. If you've got someone to do the host and you do the, the filming and the editing, whatever. But I think as a commentator, you're, you're not going to make it. I think that's important for some people to hear, honestly. Yeah, it, people like to fantasize with the idea of you can be anything you want uh, if you believe in it uh, enough. But the truth is that I don't think it's either black or white, though. Uh, yeah. However, I can never be an NBA, the best NBA player of all time. That's factual because I, I, my, my height is 182 centimeters. So how much is that? 511. So that's, I, I, it's just not possible period. And so there's some, you know, so some, some things require you to have specific attributes, which you can do nothing about. Right. Mm -hmm. And in the, and, and it is true that some things you may be able to work on and it is true that um it may require too much work for you to get there and it's just ineffective because if, if somebody that got born in france and he has a huge french accent when speaking english he wants to be an english shoutcaster 
and he will have the you know he will have the heavy french accent he'll probably need years to fix that first and foremost he, then to get the slang specific slang he wants to have he needs he needs to live somewhere literally or he needs to watch shows with actors from the same country i guess or right like it's just yeah. it's just so much added stuff that i'm 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 sure it's just not effective at some point right so i mean so um, it, so the the language one's an interesting one right because like deficio is like the perfect example of this. Oh, Anders, same story, the, by the way. Oh, Anders. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I watched your uh, your episode with Anders as well. That you know, and that's that's one thing that I when I first met Anders or first started talking and listening to Anders, I didn't actually know that Anders was Danish. Like you only really mm, hear true. it in, in when he says certain things, where you get that kind of like the 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 twang on the end of it. Um, if you hear Deficio talk. Certainly, if you if you kind of go back to the start of the ULTS, no, he's Danish. Like, he is massively Danish, right? And I think actually he, he, it troubled him a little bit. I mean, this is something that he'd have to say himself. But I know for a fact that he worked very hard with the coach to try and work, not to not to maybe change his his accent, but to make it better to understand, to to make himself clearer, and that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure if he's still doing that. I think at some point you you kind of realize that this is a, a USP, right? My this is my unique selling point. Yep. If I look at StarCraft, Todd has an incredibly French accent and it's brilliant. It's what makes Todd Todd. It, what it's why you know everyone calls him Lit Todd. Because Lit -tod. if he's if he Todd's gonna rage about something that he's seen in game. You can damn well bet that a little bit more French accent is coming on it than usual, and that's that's like his his awesome. That's one extra kind of level um, to him. Whereas, honestly, if you have like a really generic, boring English like newsreader accent, it's kind of shitty. That's kind of boring. Like, tell me, I don't know many people in esports that are, that are big enough that don't have. Something, some, some kind of accent, some, something on their accent that makes them stand out from yeah, someone yeah, else. I think, I think you're hitting the nail in the head because it's just always this trademark thing that you that you keep and carry on forever, right? Yeah. Uh, and 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 it's true that every time there's the greatest something, it's like they have this weird thing, or it's not maybe not weird but unique, right? Uh, and I saw this Saturday or Sunday. Like it was yesterday or the day before. Um, during the weekend, I saw this uh, documentary about Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and this guy, um, it was a movie something producer or something, super big deal, told him that he had to drop the German accent and that he had to change his last name because it's un unpronounceable and that his accent is shit because it's this German accent speaking English is not, not very good. And, and, and it was like, obviously, it's now proven that it's wrong that yep. if he would have changed it right uh so i don't know what's right and what's wrong what i know for certain is that some jobs require attributes that you can't develop and therefore you have to change you have to embrace what you're good at that's at the end of the day yeah. where it comes down to right find out where you're good at embrace that and and yeah learn other things satellite to that attribute but everything satellite you know everything kind of surrounding that attribute right that you have are you charismatic? Then, you know, do more podcasts, do more stuff like that. Are you good at writing? Do more articles, do more written stuff, you know, down stuff, uh, more reviews, more something, you know? Um, it's uh, kind of all about embracing what you're good at. It feels at least. I mean, again, I don't have the answer for this. I just, I just feel like that's how it feels with everybody that I see succeed. It, uh, yeah, I mean, it's difficult, right? I mean, how many people try to do... 50 different jobs before the one they find the one that they're really good at it doesn't it doesn't like make you a bad person or a shitty person or a, a failure agree. just because you say this is not for me i, I have to move on and and try and be something else right you you just got to kind of i think the problem is if you've done something long enough you're very scared of just giving it up and saying yep well, that's the I've one thing for, if if i've done it for this long i can't be that bad yeah. Whereas maybe you're not that bad, but you'd be better in something else, and that's 
kind of the did, did the you leap feel, of faith you gotta make. Do you feel this leap of faith? I mean, do you feel like this leap of faith was really tough for you? Because at the end of the day, you shoutcasted for how many years, and 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 then all of a sudden you want to get into the business side of things, into the management side of things, and logistics and things of that nature, which you have very basic understanding of, but you're by no means a master at it. How do you feel? Yeah. Um, I learned a lot very quickly. I think one thing that uh, was really good for me is that I got good relationships with people that were um, doing this kind of thing already, right? So I, I came into it and, and I talked to my boss and said, look, I don't want to move to Berlin. I want to stay here and I want to do this. I'm not going to be perfect at the start. I'm probably never going to be perfect in, in all reality, but I want to give it a go. And, you know, if after six months you think that I'm too far off the mark or too far behind, then we can talk about something else, right? And I think it made it easier for me to get out of League of Legends and do this than it would have been to... Um, for example, shoutcast Counter-Strike for ESL and then moving into a corporate position instead of... N uh, no, I think, like, moving sideways in a game... Mm -hmm. would have been more difficult for me. I see. Because, um, I don't know, it's, it's a weird one, right? Because you have, like, this this affinity with a game. Like, if I'd have, if I'd have moved sideways and said, I'm going to do Dota now. Oh, that's a uh, 180. Number one, Dota, like, the community and, and the talent around it would have absolutely seen me as the lol guy coming in. And they would have been murdered. Back. They pushed me back super hard to the point where I'd just give up, probably. Or you'd eventually fight your way through and you've wasted I don't know how many years because that's just how difficult it is to get into those scenes like really in deep. Um, I did some Counter-Strike, but I'd already been in Counter-Strike before, so it was kind of like, oh, Joe's coming back to Counter-Strike. Like I did a major, or at least a few games of the major in Cologne in 2015, right? Um, so I didn't completely drop the idea of wanting to commentate, but I think kind of saying I'm done with commentary on a serious level. I'll do some when it's fun and when I kind of can be bothered. And, you know, if the, if the game that comes is fun, which is what FIFA is for me right now, um, then I'll come back and do it. But for me, I'm definitely concentrated on developing talent, making sure that ESL products have a, a great mix of, you know, the fan favorites, but also letting these newer guys have a chance to experience events and, and come through and be next year's superstars, right? Because if if the guys at the top of their game now don't help anyone out, if we just stopped help, if, if everyone who was considered elite talent right now just stopped helping anyone else, just stopped giving anyone advice, Stop telling them how much money they should earn. That the next wave of esports commentators will be terrible. They'll be absolutely terrible. They won't have a clue what they're doing. They'll be unorganized. And I think we we kind of owe it to ourselves as an industry because for me, in my head, this is just the start of esports, right? Like yep. when I'm long gone, people might look back and say, you know, this guy did a lot to develop the commentary side of esports. And I guess that's kind of a a philosophical aim in a way that you know when i'm when i'm dead that people still actually care about me somehow that's deep i know i like that oh. so how do you see yourself in 10 years it's very cheesy dead. but no, <laughs> <laughs> no um i've asked myself this question a lot and it's it's really hard because if i the way the way that i always like to kind of answer this question because i don't know why but it's something that comes up quite a lot, but going back 10 years and seeing what I was doing, 2018 now, and 10 years ago, I was at Fnatic. Like, to this very day, I was still working for Fnatic. Um, I, made that, I made that jump from Fnatic to ESL in one week. Literally, I got a call from ESL saying, okay, we want you. This is how much we're going to pay you. When can you come? I told Fnatic on the same day, and I think six days later, I moved to Germany. 
I don't think I could be that kind of person anymore that would just literally say, see you boys, I'm leaving town. I'm going to America. I mean, I couldn't do that without a visa anyway, but still. Um, so for me, it's like super hard to say because I don't want to... I don't want to pigeonhole myself. I'd like it to still be esports, but if it's not, okay. If it's not still esports, then I hope it's something that makes me as happy as esports has done, right? Okay. That's I nice. mean, let, let me turn this around. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? Do you see yourself still being at the forefront of G2? One one question one uh, one point that you made with in the in the podcast with Anders really intrigued me, which was you have these fantasies about completely failing and losing everything, and then building it back up. But would you go as so far as to just build it back up without the failing, as in start again? Um, well, there is the short answer is if there would be no politics and no. If there would be nothing bad associated with doing that, then the, the short answer is yes. Mm. Um, yes, a, to, to prove a point, actually. <laughs> because it's fun to prove points. I like that. That's like literally how I run my life. I just prove points on a daily basis. Um, but of course, you know, I'd have to sell G2 for that to happen, uh, which is in my heart. And I would then, it's like a mi big middle finger to whoever I sell it to that mm -hmm. after whatever to go again right to go again and be competitor so i think yeah. that the reality is that i will always be associated with you two in one way or another i will always own part of it and um, right now i have absolute ownership i mean not absolute ownership but i have absolute power over everything that happens in the company uh, and uh, i so it, for me it's clear i mean i always i always say and this this is actually a pretty nice thing i'm like so you see this story. This is a nice story. Talking about fish. Uh, <laughs> it's a nice story, you know. Somebody, this man is a hardworking man. He's just, he just loves to fish, you know, in his boat. He just goes out and fishes. He just takes so much pleasure in fishing and fishing and fishing. And all of a sudden, you know, he's just picking up 10, 20 fish every day. And he realizes he has too 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 many fish. He can't eat it all, you know? So he sells the rest. And he realized that he can make a business with it. So he picks up somebody that helps him out. And now, you know, with nets and all that, they improve the gear and yada, yada, yada. It's like they make now 200 fish a day, right? And then at some point, the guy grows his company to become so large that they have like boats all over the country just picking up fish. And it's like the largest fish uh, seller uh, in the country and that takes like 20 years right and all of a sudden the guy's like well great you know he just sells the company and he's like great now i can just go out and do what i love the most which is fishing and just goes out again with the shitty boat shitty ass boat goes into the lake and just fishes we just, so just by, with more money let, so everyone that's watching let me just translate that for you into uh real into english real. so Ocelot starts as a player. Is that a hint? Was, was this, so is this, is this Ocelot hinting at him going back to being a player? <laughs> he started that's, off as, that's even he deeper than off I was trying to as, go to. As the player, you know? I was, I was in the end, he, he needs some teammates. In the end of that, they decide they make a team. At some point, they come and sell off the team. I tried to go. He goes back to doing what he loves the most, yeah. playing games. That's even deeper than I tried to go. <laughs> But yeah, I, I was like, you know, when I'm a billionaire, I will probably just own this and that and this and that. And I'll probably just own a, a, a sports team. What kind of sports yeah. do I love the most? Esports. So I will own a, an esports team. Wait a second. I already own an esports team. So I already have in my mind my dream job. And that is, um, I, I, like, I, I acknowledge how incredibly rare that is. So I, yeah. I, I take that and hug it and... I love I love my life right now my my job that's, life. That's 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 a funny thing actually because I I I also like had these thoughts fairly recently as well that you know do I just want to go for like the simple life you know do I want to 
train to be i don't know something do i do i want to go out on a farm and just help when i want and just live off the little money that i have and be happy with that and a you know a family and a little house and shitty car but happy you know and doing what you love then i realized well actually i'm just doing what i love already so why should i kind of find something that someone else loves as like this weird ideal because there are many people I think who would love to be in the position that we kind of are right now, which sure. is, you know, turning what, what be, first of all into a job and then into a, into an actual full blown successful career. Many people will do it as well in the future and many people won't, but I think we've at this time, at this time, you say you, the original question was where do I where do I see myself yeah. in ten years? If I'm honest, in esports, I think it has to, it has to be. I don't think I could ever. I don't think I have the balls to say goodbye to esports realistically. And also, that's just my, my gut feeling. You know, also this compounds like the the value of you being in esports compounds because not only were you the oldest dog, but also you know if you look ten years ahead. Who do you think people will go to? Like, there's, there's not that many old school people, and some of them will, mm-hmm. will leave at some point because they're not just, they're just not good enough. Uh, so, sure. so not that many people will, will be left in a few years from now. And having that pedigree is so important. It's like we are the pure breed of true gamers. You know, that we've seen it all. We've seen those hundred viewer tournament in, in showcast. I mean, you know, it's just, it's just how it is, uh, and and that has beauty and value over time. So changing that would be uh, all I can say theory. is 10 years is going to be some weird place. I'm excited to see it. I know, man. You know, imagine 20 years from now. You know, I, I love to fantasize about this. Imagine 20 years from now when technology is so good and so cheap that you can literally have like an AR gladiator arena where like people like maybe, it's, yeah, it must be like 20 years is a, is a realistic kind of time frame like AR gladiator arena, people just throwing magic at each other and shit like that. I'm just making up a game right now as we speak, but imagine that, you know, like imagine how cool would that be that you're like a gladiator. And then if you lose that fight, imagine UFC or imagine real life gladiators, you can't fight for like either six months or you can actually have a game that decides everything. Like whoever loses this game is forever banned from this, from competing here. Mm. And, And then you're like, it's like that game everybody will watch, you know, imagine the kind of McGregor versus, um, versus, um, uh, holy shit, versus, um, uh, Khabib, the name is, yeah. is, is, is now being worked on, um, you know, and, and that kind of, like everybody will watch that, you know, and I like to have that level of technology that allows for that to happen. And that will one day be the case. One day you will have the ultimate hunger games experience which is pretty much battle royale i guess battle royale is like a faster hunger games right uh, imagine a real like hunger games big thing where nobody actually can die in real life but you can get banned from the game forever which is like death in your avatar yeah, and you're that's out of insane it. that's that's your career like imagine that is esp- that's the ultimate esport and there will be a moment oh f- i get so pumped with this like imagine right now everybody's like idolizing the physical qualities of Cristiano Ronaldo, for example, or, you know, I don't know, Tom Brady or LeBron James, whatever, right? Uh, But then maybe, and I say maybe because it's not always the case, but they may not be the most intelligent or best leaders or best whatever, whatever, right? So they're just good physically and they understand the game and they understand how to play it and things like that. They may be also smart, but typically those stars don't go hand in hand with being smart precisely, right? It's not their major attribute, at least. And then you have the gamers, right? On the other hand, which are like super fast, and you know they don't they don't necessarily need to be fast in real life, like physically, right? But they're fast mentally. There will be a moment in which you will need to have the ultimate super athlete, right? Which will need to be physically fit and also super smart, which is when the technology reaches that point, and that will be the ultimate entertainment. I don't know what kind of game would that be, but I think there is nothing more pure than 
gladiator arena like games but that to keep it epic you'd only be able to do it like once every two years right do you think that like if you look at a world cup final is only epic if you do it once every four years if you did a world cup final three times a year yeah but same goes for boxing and ufc there's like a there's there's matches happening very often it's just that the level of viewership is like 20 times less if not less than when you know mcgregor competes right so mm. I think there's, you know, and I think the UFC model, by the way, is the best model ever. Like, I love that. I really love that. You have, if you want to, if you're a diehard fan of the sport, then, you know, you can watch as many matches as, as, as you want. Like even female, whatever you are interested in. Now, if you're a casual, you can just pay for that one match between Connor and Khabib and you will have a blast. Or maybe the guy just knocks him in two two seconds. But <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah. but, but anyway, for us complete amateurs, you know, it's that's awesome. just the thing, right? And same goes for World Cup. Like, pretty sure most of the people that watch World Cup never watch football. I'm myself. I'm one of them. I sure. I, I never watch soccer anymore. Uh, but I I you know I like to watch World Cup. It's like a thing you watch. And it's not so much about the sport, it's about what happens around it, like the production quality, what have you know, all the nation stuff and the drama and so on. That's amazing. Imagine if we could have something like that for esports. I mean, this that this kind of goes case. like it you know, this goes like all the way back to like what I was talking to you, what, what my initial point to you about pot of money for a marketing team or for a superstar. Uh imagine that you could spend three years marketing one person for one game just one fight one match like you could you could make that so insane yeah absolutely but true <laughs> remains to be seen in esports i know but somebody I, will be come happy up with that the day. that's the beauty of uh, not being a traditional sport uh, as we understand them because nba of yeah. basketball will never die football will never die it may decelerate but it will never die and that means that they don't feel the need to keep upgrading the sport. And mm -hmm. here is like the most open market you can ever find. Right now you have every publisher just trying to uh, fight each other essentially to create the biggest esport or game yeah. again. Uh, and, and somebody will come up with this. Somebody will. Somebody will. So like th there are a number of publishers right now focused on creating the ultimate esports experience. And somebody will get it right. Will it be one of the ones we already know? Maybe, but it, it may not be as well. So I mean, that's the beauty. Um, let's go back ten years. Did we know Riot Games? No, exactly not. We yeah. we, we we thought that uh, Blizzard would own the world. I mean, they're still going strong, actually. And if if, if you're invested in Activision Blizzard stock, you're having a good time. But yep. But uh, yeah, Valve, Valve, same story, you know. But at the end of the day, now you look at you know Hi-Res, Psyonix, even EA, Ubisoft with um, with Rainbow Six, they're kicking Rainbow, ass. Yeah. By the way, we, we yeah. just we just got the team, insane team actually. They won today. Um, um, bam, bam, bam. we got them from Penta actually. They're world champions. Mm -hmm. That that for me, like Rainbow Six is what a great game actually. I, I don't I don't want to say it's come out of nowhere, but they had a, like, compared to what they have now, like, their release was really rocky. Things didn't go, you know, super well, but they've kind of made the game better as they go along. They've managed to grow their player base, which is something you don't see very often. Like, Especially player base game that you pay growing. to play. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, they've, they've done a lot of the Pro League stuff. Um, obviously, ESL, we work very closely with them. And I think, like... It's just super incredible to see that a game that's so old as it is, I mean, I guess three years, four years old now? Probably. Like, it's, it's just going up and up and up and up. And that's not the usual. Yeah, yeah. Like, they're not following the usual path here. 100%. So that's, I, I, I think Ubisoft, like, if you just said five years ago, a, a publisher that probably won't do well in esports. I might have looked at them as a, a kind of candidate for that, right? Yeah, yeah. you're right. But Absolutely. What, what, what they've done with this game is just incredible. And it's really, a sort of really patience. Good. Like 
nobody believed in the game and they just had patience. They upgraded the yeah. game. They gave uh, a lot of room for creators to create great maps and yada yada yada. And th yeah. just, they have just great people now in the in the esports team. And and the game is just amazing. I mean, it it's yeah. come to a point where it's just fu very fun to watch. I started watching it three months ago and I was getting shocked with how nice the game. I've, I've never watched it before. But mm -hmm. it, like the the map overview at the beginning, like everything is so understandable, right? Yeah. It, it it looks to me a little bit like Counter Strike. Like it's really it really does feel like a realistic version of Counter Strike, like a realistic, yeah. realistic tactical version of Counter Strike. I guess that would be. That's what it is, right? I I remember playing like, my, it might have even been the same LAN where I met Od that we were playing like Rainbow Six who? Raven when, when Shield. You Od. Ah, Od. Um. I think we were playing back then Rainbow Six Raven Shield, like co-op against bots. And it, like, it, for me, it brings back that same feeling that the, these Rainbow Six games have had, but esports-wise, have somehow just like never been cool. But they've made like all credit to them. Like, if I had a hat on, I would definitely tip it. Yeah. Uh, it would be soft for this one. And Psyonix yeah. and Rocket League, I will say the same story. Like, Rocket League is another game that is just growing in... in unique active i mean sorry in daily active users because everybody talks about unique active users nowadays because actually player bases shrink and they yeah. rather speak about the total number of players that ever played the game historically but you know rocket league is stays strong and like viewership stays, stays strong you know that's so hard especially with yeah. a game that costs money and and at the end of the day a lot of it is the same the same way right now if anybody that hasn't been in esports in, has a computer first thing they'll do is install fortnite and 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 maybe get Rocket League. Like that's like you know that's like the the most console thing you can do in a in a computer. You know, <laughs> yeah. when you're like yeah. you come from outside esports, like that's pretty much what you do first and foremost. And before that was actually League of Legends. People would install League of Legends, and people would just default into installing League of Legends and playing it. And Counter mm -hmm. Strike has just been also a constant there. So that's when you get there as a publisher, that has to be like. The go to like that's just the winning position when when you just get everybody to default into installing your game that's and that's like for me like just the great thing about it, right because if you go back like you say League of Legends came out of literally came out of nowhere um and became what it was, definitely not overnight but fast um Obviously, PUBG now coming along, which Fortnite kind of took some momentum from, definitely. But like the the way it shot up is incredible. Um, then also seeing games like Rainbow Six getting stronger despite not having a release they were looking for. Like this is not trends that we've generally seen, right? Like I think the the last big boom trend like that was off the back of StarCraft 2, and that was only because it was StarCraft 2, yep. because everyone had played StarCraft and WarCraft yep. 3 and was waiting for StarCraft 2. Like, it wasn't really a, a hello, I'm here kind of thing. Like I, I, I would and, say, uh, I think the Activision Blizzard probably... Actually, let's not say Activision Blizzard, let's say Blizzard. Like, you know, the Blizzard games are made by social engineers. Like, they will make you spend years on their game i'm literally talking like real talk here like if i would if i would do this command in world of warcraft of how many of how, how much i played <laughs> i think it would show like 509 days or some shit like that like yeah. and my last ever time i touched world of warcraft again because i'm a, of addictive nature is 2009 actually when i quit professionally i told myself if i want to succeed i can't install this game ever again because it's the greatest game that has ever existed in the history of humanity, hands down. And I don't think anything like World of Warcraft will ever exist again. It's ridiculous. Like, I found it more fun than real life in every sense. It was insane. There I was with a big ass shoulders and this thunder fury going around the city. Everybody looking at me. But, but was World of Warcraft like your, your first true love? No, I played Day of Defeat, Counter Strike, semi professionally. I wasn't the team Spain of Day of Defeat. Dude, you're speaking with somebody that knows how to aim, you know? 
<laughs> no, but like for me, Battlefield, <laughs> not, no other Battlefield, Battlefield will, too, like, will, will probably ever is insane. like that one did, right? I agree. Um, I think that's something that you can't, you just can't do. Like the 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 feeling that you build up the first time that you play something, the first time you get like addicted to it and play it more and more and more and join teams and meet like really cool people that you actually are friends with now. Um, I think you can't go back and like say, okay, World of Warcraft Two is coming. Could it grab you like World of Warcraft would? Probably not. Impossible. I, I don't think it's possible to make that game, by the way. Like, you can't make the game anymore. I don't think. Like, you know the depth that fucking game has? Like, yeah. it requires thousands of developers working in the game for years before it gets released. That's not yeah. going to happen. Like, it's just not going to happen. Right now, you get into World of Warcraft, and there's just so much depth everywhere. Like, mm -hmm. so many different instances that you can play. It's just so many different quests. It must be like thousands and th tens of thousands of quests must be like, yeah. that's insane, you know, and, and that level of depth, you only get through the years. That's why I say that I don't think there's, it's possible that a game ever gets close to that because it's just years and years and years of patches and expansions and just changes and development. Did you ever play World of Warcraft? Yeah. So I played like, like. On vanilla, I think I played like to level forty, and then got bored. Like my the problem that I had that all the guys that I played Battlefield with jumped into World of Warcraft. I played with them to level forty, and then like went on holiday or something. Oh, and when I, I came back, they were level sixty, and I was like, "Ah, fuck you guys." Yeah, it, it's I'm, true. I'm out. By the way, it's so funny because every now and then your voice will cut for like one millisecond. And it it just cut in the F word, so it's just wonderful. You just auto uh, you just auto muted yeah. yourself, you know. Skills auto after all, after all these years of talking, <laughs> you, can, you can you can make it so the audio equipment <laughs> takes <laughs> takes away your worst moments on air where you accidentally <laughs> say the F bomb. He learns how you are. <laughs> That'd um, be nice. So so I think that there is a social aspect to it, man. Like I there has to be because. My big, my best friends, I mean, I don't have that many friends. I don't have that many friends. Maybe I have like friends, friends, how many friends? What do you consider a friend? What, what is a friend here? It's like somebody that you'd like tell him something private or whatever, right? Yeah, I think you can consider someone a friend if you tell them a secret. Right. So let's say like I have three, three friends, right? And like, more or less. And like, all of them have like, you know, some to do to with with World of Warcraft days, mm. like, and and that is, I think, the important aspect, like the social aspect. So when you tell me that you went holidays and then everybody else was sixty and you CBA leveling up again, I, I yeah. totally get that. And just whatever, you know. The uh, thing is with Legion as well. I bought so I I bought Legion. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get into it now. All these years later, and I played with uh, with Demon and his girlfriend, and the same happened. The same happened. And now it's like leveling from, I think, like, I use a boost, right? So you level 100. And is there, like, 110 levels now? But obviously, like, one level takes about 4 million years, it feels like. So, <laughs> like, even just half a level behind is, like, I don't know, three days worth of playtime. And then I can't, I can't stick to some, like, I'm, I'm really bad for this. Like, if you look at my Steam account, it's full of, like sale purchases or just shit that i thought this is gonna be really good i'm gonna buy this and play like two minutes yeah i have the same and then just nothing I, else 90 percent really, of my really steam library 90 percent of my steam library is games that have all the way from seven to 90 minutes of gameplay and then i yeah. never touch them again never ever ever and most of them are on the 11 minute range i feel like that has to be the average like i just this... join i'm like this is shit I will never play this, but I always feel bad about refunding. I don't know why, but I always, I, I just don't want to refund because I, I mean, yeah, sometimes I do because it's just so deplorable that you just want to refund just to sh make a point. But if the game is like not for you, but you can clearly see everybody is like voting positively and so on, you just don't want to like refund, I guess. But yeah, I have all these games in the library just laughing at me. 
Yeah, I mean, it's good that Steam have the, the limit, right, for how Two much, hours, right? how often you can refund and stuff. Because I could pull, like, I don't know, it feels like I could just take five grand out of Steam right now. And, can uh, you actually refund if you played less than two hours, even years after? Uh, I don't know. Not sure. I guess that's, not. That's, it's probably yeah, got, like, some six-month limit on it or something, right. and two and a half hours or whatever it is. Probably. But. Probably. Um, well, I think that we, we, you know, I, I have a lot of things I would like to talk about, but it's getting late and I know I have a commitment, uh, yeah, actually in nine too. minutes, in nine minutes. And I'm sure me you do too. too. This was yeah, longer exactly. than I thought I it just, would be. I just got, I just got a notification. I was like, ha, ah, what's that? Okay. It's already half past five nearly. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense by the way. Like <laughs> it's just, I love this podcast because it's like a friend, it's a conversation between friends, you know, and it's just. When you're speaking, a lot of memories come into my mind, and it's just so nice, man. It's just so, so nice. Uh, and I really hope that whatever it is that is in stock for us moving forward, uh, you're part of that. You're part of uh, the nice future of esports, and you get to enjoy your share, which I think you very much deserve as well. You too, man. I mean, I use you as an example when I talk to new people in esports of the the learning curve in terms of or not a learning curve but a development curve in esports when they talk about players being uh you know young and not knowing what they're doing you're an example of someone who came into esports young and not knowing what you were doing but was hungry enough to go out there and actually figure it all out like it's seri imp seriously impressive where you are and i only wish you the best my man joe i just it's big goosebumps <laughs> <laughs> you know you, you always have a friend here and uh also a business friend here um i your your experience speaks by itself bro you have anything to say to anybody uh, to everybody watching some of them are fans some of them are decision makers in the industry some of them i, I always forget about telling to, to tell this to the to the um to the invites the joe and you have to remind me to tell them what the target audience of the podcast is <laughs> <laughs> because that's that's an important point, you know. So Joe, it turns out that this podcast podcast is watched approximately like fifty percent fans, then fifty percent decision makers, of which some of uh, some of them are uh, executives in companies and yada yada yada, or project managers of different companies or investors. So you just dropped a couple of f bombs to all these people. You should feel proud yeah. about it. Absolutely, did um, <laughs> you? You know, you said again last podcast. Uh, you said that. You really enjoy it because you. This is how you are. Like if you censored yourself, then uh, it wouldn't be you anymore. And I'm and I'm kind of the same, right? So I mean, what I would urge for the the fifty percent that are out there, you know, looking to make moves in esports, looking to, you know, get involved and do good for the industry in their in their own ways. I think utilizing people like Carlos is the best way that you can ever be involved like talk to people talk to talk don't talk to the guys on linkedin that say they've worked <laughs> for three months in a in an esports startup as a as a consultant talk to the guys who've really been there talk to the guys who worked in an aquarium whilst <laughs> trying to fund their exactly. hobby and, and turn it into a job exactly uh, and for the people that are fans support your games support your commentators support the leagues if you see things that aren't right approach it constructively like go and provide constructive criticism to people don't call them fat don't call them ugly ginger english idiots just say look joe i wish you didn't shout quite as loud i mean i probably won't listen to you anyway but it's better feedback than <laughs> what we used to get so enjoy it amen amen well, thanks very much, Joe. You're the absolute best. Um, Been a pleasure. And uh, for everybody else that's still around, thanks very much for watching this very long podcast. I really had a blast. Uh, you know, Joe is a very special guy, and I know him. I know him very well, and I'm glad to say that I'm, I'm sure we'll be friends for a long, long time. Um, and I'm sure that things will smile on his end. He's a workaholic. He loves his sports. He has the experience. Stop laughing, man. I'm trying, try, trying to make a beautiful outro. God damn it. <laughs> and support Joe wherever he goes. As you guys heard, he he always has something nice to say. He's a super wholesome person. And yeah, I, I honestly love him. People, 
You know I like to... <laughs> Are you ready, Dajou? Mm -hmm. You know I like to uh, promote the G2 Esports shop when I hit the outro button. Uh, and that's where I'll start talking about all the things you can buy and how you can support us. But before I promote our shop, let me promote our shop. G2Esports.com slash shop. You can buy this beautiful black thing, which actually has my name on it. I don't know if you can put the name today, but if they wait a few months, I'm pretty sure we'll do it again. The black one, whew, the American, America. Beautiful one. What, what do you give me this? Can we actually... They cannot buy this, right? No. This is ours. We have an English videographer that likes this. Yo, you like, you like this? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I won't want to. We, 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 have the, we have the Queen's picture around as well, by the way. <laughs> 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 and the pink one beautiful one and we have also this is by the way the alpha version alpha male version and the inverse so you can just buy all of these for approximately how much is all of this a thousand five hundred euros i mean i'm not gonna lie we're not a cheap brand so but this this is good quality like i wear this for the gym okay did i did i go to sell out the joe did i go far to sell out Maybe I, maybe I passed the threshold of selloutness. People, we love you. YouTube.com slash shop. Buy everything. And now I'm going to click the button. Let me recreate as if I was hitting the button. Okay? Three, two, one. I mean, I'm not going to lie. We're not a cheap brand. So, but this, this is good quality. Like, I wear this for the gym. Okay? Did I, did I go to sellout?